So good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. I'm Polly Weekin. I am the Science and Stewardship Program Manager for the Central Pine Barrens Commission. Um, I hope that you can hear me. If you can't, um, you can use the chat button um, to communicate with uh, us and we can help you troubleshoot through the chat button. Um, but a couple of uh, housekeeping things as we um, move forward through the program today. Um, it'll run from nine to one. There'll be some PowerPoint presentations that Matt will go through. And then he'll also have some videos on um, the sampling technique. So uh, we'll have a, a couple breaks throughout the program, but you know, obviously if you need your own break, uh, please, please take them. Um, if you have questions, please use the chat button and um, I can direct those questions to Matt um, accordingly. And um, I guess if you have any problems, again, just use the chat button. Please make sure you keep your uh, video um, off and your uh, mute button off as well so that we can maintain a good quality uh, program for everyone. It reduces the bandwidth and helps um, uh, the clarity come through. Um, we do have uh, about 42 people today. So thank you everybody for calling in and participating. Um, we had hoped to do this in person, um, but the circumstances as they are, uh, we're using this stopgap method, which a lot of other people are. So I'm happy to introduce Matt Schlesinger. He is the chief uh, zoologist for the New York Natural Heritage Program. And him and Aaron White are heading up the Empire Pollinator or the Empire State uh, Native Pollinator Survey. Uh, we're in the second year of participating for the commission and we're excited to have Matt. So um, I find this training to be excellent, um, both for this surveying project, but also future surveying projects as well. So I'll let Matt take it from there. Thanks, Polly. Um, I just wanna make sure that everyone can hear me okay, or at least uh, Polly, could you tell me if, you, if I'm coming in loud and clear? Yep, I can hear you fine. Okay, and if you wanted to um, unblock my video for a second, just to, so people can see that there's a human being talking to them, I'll wave and then we can turn it off for the bulk of the presentation, which will be by PowerPoint. You should be able to turn your video on. Yes, now I can. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Human being here. Um, thank you for joining us in this very experimental way of uh, doing our pollinator trainings. So bear with me as we um, as we attempt this new version of a, of a training that is, has always been in person in the last couple of years we've been doing them. And of course, everything's changing right now and, and, and a lot of us are doing these remote sessions. So uh, Polly is brave to offer to host to the first one of these and, um, and I hope it goes well. And, and, and again, we can keep it you know, casual in the sense that you can ask questions as, as we go, just like if you were in the room with us. Um, all right, I'm gonna turn off the video now and, and get to the presentation and um, Let's get started. So I'm not sure I can do it. <clears throat> All right. Well, thank you also, Polly, to, uh, for the nice introduction and, um, and uh, the opportunity to present to everybody. This started out as a, of a training that Polly requested for uh, Central Pine Barrens staff and their colleagues. And, um, and and then it's it's grown since then, and, and she was kind enough to make it available to others. So uh, so thank you for that. I think 42 people is, is great. That's more people than we typically give these trainings to, again, because we're, we're doing in-person trainings and there's sort of a limit to how much one person can attend to the uh, needs and, and questions of, of that many people, especially when we do a field component. But our field component today will be um, via videos that, um, that the USGS has put together on pollinator sampling methods. So that's, that's new. Um, and uh, <clears throat> I'm gonna try not to be distracted myself by the chat button. <laughs> Sorry, I started, read, started reading chats, but I should, uh, I should focus on getting the presentation to let Polly and Jade handle that. Um, I think I'll jump right in. Um, I, I think, uh, well, Polly introduced Aaron also. Um, Aaron might join us later uh, for, for part of the, the session, but um, uh, Aaron White is a, a zoologist and project coordinator with the Natural Heritage Program, and she and I are co-leading this effort. Uh, she and I have split these trainings over the last few years, and much of what you'll see in this presentation uh, is based on materials, and, and some of it is exactly the, what she developed um, 
for the workshops that she gives. I've tailored them a bit to, to my style and, and um, added and subtracted things, you know, as, a, as I've thought appropriate for this version of the training. Uh, but Aaron deserves a lot of credit for putting um, most of these materials together to begin with. So let's see if we can move on. All right, first, a quick introduction to the New York Natural Heritage Program for those of you who aren't familiar with us. We are part of a network of natural heritage programs. Um, every state has one, as well as most Canadian provinces, many Latin American countries. And these programs were created starting in the 1970s by the Nature Conservancy, and then farmed out um, by TNC to different state agencies and universities, and in some, case not, in some cases, other nonprofits. Uh, and so we started as a Nature Conservancy program, like many of them did. And then in um, 2012, we moved to um, the SUNY College of Environmental Science and Forestry. And I say moved uh, only in the, in the administrative sense. So uh, we are still based in Albany. Uh, we work out of the state DEC building in Albany, the central office of DEC. But we work closely now with um, SUNY ESF faculty and students, and in fact, some are on our advisory committee and we've had students from SUNY ESF participate in our project. So um, we're overseen, I'm, I'm skipping around a little bit here, but we're overseen by an organization called NatureServe that coordinates the work of the natural heritage programs, rolls up those state level and, and country level data to larger scales, uh, so national and, and global scales. And so they really set the methodology and the standards that the natural heritage programs follow. This slide um, of a lot of the taxa and species that we work on in the Natural Heritage Program is intended as a bit of a disclaimer. Um, we cover a wide suite of, of uh, rare animal species in the Natural Heritage Program, from moths to whales to frogs to dragonflies and now pollinators. And, um, and I include this slide in part to say, um, well, first, I'm not an entomologist. Um, I'm, I'm a broadly trained ecologist and wildlife biologist. And uh, I have learned, as many of us do in natural heritage, to dabble in a lot of different taxa. So <clears throat> on any given day and in any given hour, I might be working on a bird project or a whale project or a frog project or a pollinator project. And so I'm not an expert in these taxa. I've learned some and I'll share with you what I've learned and I will share with you things that I have not learned. <laughs> I will share with you things I am not expert in and, um, and there will be questions that you will have about some of the focal taxa, for instance, that I probably won't be able to answer. So I'm just uh, putting that out there as a uh, uh, disclaimer right off the bat. I will do my best to answer your questions or get back to you if I, if I can't answer questions that you have. <clears throat> so again, with our agenda, um, and this is loose because we haven't done it this way before. I don't know exactly how long everything will take, um, but we'll start off with uh, the goal of the project. ESNPS is our abbreviation for Empire State Native Pollinator Survey. I wanted a really slick acronym that spelled, you know, a word that, but I couldn't come up with one, and our whole advisory committee couldn't come up with one, so it's boring. Uh, we'll talk about our target species, our survey methodologies, and intro to basic pollinator biology. So that's a lot of me talking at you for the better part of two hours. We will have a break in there. Um, I'll need a break, <laughs> and you will need a break. And um, and so uh, it's a it's a long PowerPoint um, filled with information. Uh, you should have been provided a copy of the presentation. I would ask uh, for now that you keep that. Um, within your circles. So um, because there are uh, a lot of photographs in there and, and things that, um, that we're fine to present and I'm fine to share with you all, but we don't necessarily have permission to put out and certainly not to publish. So um, just please keep those within your professional circles for now. But you can follow along with that presentation if you want, you'll see it on the screen, um, but then it's an opportunity to return later if, if you're unclear on something or, or you don't feel like taking notes and just wanna have the slides. Um, I've left a lot of text in these slides because um, they're meant to be notes for you as well. So um, if I were giving a public presentation, I'd probably just show pretty pictures, but this is more of a sort of traditional PowerPoint with a lot of bullets and, and text in it because um, we're trying to teach and we're trying to uh, give people uh, a resource for um, learning about these species and about the methodologies. So our field training 
uh, will be in the form of videos. Uh, luckily, um, Sam Drogi from the USGS, who is uh, one of our project advisors, uh, had started developing videos on, um, on bee sampling. And the bee sampling methods work for a lot of the pollinator taxa. And so he started, um, he started building these videos, maybe 2010, something like that. Some of them are, are, are quite old, but, um, but still relevant. And, um, and so they're five or six minute videos. And so we'll show a couple of those. We'll take a break. We'll talk about things. We'll talk about what our project has done a little bit differently from how he displays things in the videos. And then we'll move on. And so that's the better part of half an hour talking about uh, what we do in the field. We'll do an iNaturalist training uh, and, and demo and, and then a discussion of any questions of that. Um, and then what, what I'm calling the lab training, which is where we watch Sam show us how to wash and dry and and pin specimens for those of you who might be participating by submitting specimens. And then time for discussion and, and Q&A at the end, I hope. Maybe we'll end earlier than one, uh, that would be fine, but, um, but I imagine we'll have enough discussion and things that we'll, we'll keep it going. But we'll try certainly try not to go past one o'clock. All right, the objectives of the morning. Um, we're mainly interested in, in having you become familiar with our survey methodologies, the data submission procedure for our project and basic native pollinator biology. It is true that you don't need to understand all that much about these taxa in order to sample them, um, but it might make you more interested and engaged uh, and, and um, if you are uh, more familiar with their biology and their conservation issues and how to tell them apart. So that's why we include in our trainings a fair bit of, of uh, background knowledge like that. So survey methodologies for the SNPS, uh, <laughs> I left this objective in, experience capturing pollinator specimens in the field. Um, well, in the field meaning watching a video because that's our version of the field these days. Uh, we hope that will change in the coming months. Um, record keeping and data submission procedures. And then the pollinator biology part. This is not in order actually. We're gonna do pollinator biology before we do a lot of the methodological discussion. And an overall appreciation for the diversity and resources that are available. I'm gonna show you some book covers and some websites. And again, that's all available to you in the, in the PDF version of the presentation that, that you should have. So, um, so uh, you don't have to scribble notes or anything. All right, it is always important, I think, to, re to uh, review our high school biology and talk about what pollination is. Um, just in case we, we forget, um, pollination is, uh, the method by which flowering plants reproduce. And without pollination, um, there would be no flowering plants. In fact, pollination is the process that evolved along with the evolution of flowers. The main goal of pollination is to transfer uh, the male uh, genes that are held in, um, in pollen, which is the, the sperm of the plant. And that goes from the anther, um, the anther which is you know, these little parts of the flowers, I think you should be able to see my, my arrow, um, my cursor here, so that from the anther to the stigma, and then um, the pollen trans travels down, grows a pollen tube, travels down um, and into the ovary where fertilization takes place and then uh, a seed can grow. So this is an extremely important process for flowering plants, um, obviously, you know, otherwise they could not reproduce except um, those plants that can, there are plants that can self-pollinate and there are plants that can grow vegetatively. Um, but for uh, plants that reproduce primarily by flowers, pollination is the process. And there are a lot of methods of pollination. Um, and, uh, and so there's, there's abiotic factors and there's biotic factors, right? So um, there's, wind pollinated plants. So a lot of maples, for instance, grow pretty um, uh, nondescript flowers uh, because they don't need to be attractive to, to animals uh, and they can, um, they can pollinate primarily by wind. The wind picks up the pollen grains and, and then there's so many produced that by chance they fall on other maples and, and pollinate those flowers. There are some plants that are water pollinated. It's pretty rare, but, but there are some that are. Within the um, Biotic group here, we have bird pollination and in the Northeast US, it's, it's a single species. It's the ruby-throated hummingbird that provides that service. Um, we don't talk much about, um, about hummingbirds in, uh, in our project. Our project is focused on insects, 
uh, because they've, they've received less attention and we understand their conservation status more poorly. So insect pollinators are, are the biggies. Um, in in um, the Northeast US, bats are not pollinators. So they are insect eaters um, exclusively, but in other parts of the world, Southwest US and then the tropics, bats are important pollinators. And I include this slide with a little um, confused monkey or ape to show you that you can't trust everything you get off the internet um, because this is a, meant to be a similar uh, sort of uh, pollination vector slide. Um, but in the middle there, um, it's showing a dandelion and its spores blowing away in the wind. Well, the spores are the seeds. <clears throat> this is not a method of pollination. <laughs> this is a method of seed dispersal. So don't trust everything you get off the internet, kids. That's the rule. And we're here talking about pollinators because um, pollinators have been documented to be in decline. So there's a, a book um, called The Forgotten Pollinators. I think it came out in 1996. And it took a while, even that was a well-received book and, and, and received some press at the time, but it took a long time really before um, uh, government started paying attention and, and scientists really started um, uh, focusing on, on, uh, on, on bee declines. Um, in fact, it was honeybees, uh, the colony collapse disorder that, that really brought um, the plight of other pollinators into uh, the public eye. These are titles of some recent scientific papers. I'm not gonna read them, but there's some titles that, that show that um, there are uh, pollinators in a variety of groups uh, that have been shown to be in decline over the last 40, 50 years, sometimes in the last 20 or 30 years. And what are the causes of those declines? Well, um, I put my frightening um, red font on here to, to show you how, how critical these are, but they range. and um, and, and depending on, they're very species specific, sometimes they're species group specific, uh, but there are a lot of potential causes of pollinator declines that include um, invasive species like dandelions um, as an example, although dandelions provide some foraging habitat for, uh, and some foraging, um, some nectar for uh, early season bees. Um, still, they're an invasive uh, that, that, can, um, that can wipe out natural meadow vegetation. Uh, this is a Cumpsulura fly in the middle that is a fly that was introduced to control gypsy moths and has also uh, been documented to have effects on po other pollinating moths like hawk moths or sphinx moths. Pesticides, of course, um, are, are potentially a really big factor. Um, I think uh, the overall message of this slide is that there isn't one single factor. We can't just point to neonicotinoids or we can't just point to habitat loss. As the, as the cause of pollinator declines, but there are many interacting factors. Habitat loss is certainly one, um, especially subdivisions that get named after uh, what they destroyed to create the subdivision. Uh, interruption of natural disturbance. Here's, um, here's somebody putting out a fire in a barrens-like ecosystem. Well, maybe that's a Rocky Mountain West, <laughs> but, um, but in, in uh, ecosystems that have evolved with fire, like the Pine Barrens, um, <clears throat> pardon me, uh, fire, these are fire dependent ecosystems and, and without fire, uh, they tend to be, um, get encroached on by vegetation, uh, sometimes undesirable vegetation and sometimes non-native vegetation. And, um, and that leads to a loss of, of suitable nesting habitat for a lot of these species that, that require bare sand or, or other bare ground. And of course, climate change is having impacts primarily what's been documented in the literature. This, this graph shows how, um, the timing of, of, uh, of flowering in a plant um, might, uh, might become mismatched from the timing of emergence of an insect. And if the insect emerges too late um, for, uh, for its floral resource, um, then there's a mismatch, the insect doesn't get fed and the, and the plant doesn't get pollinated. So recognizing this, um, these declines and, and causes of these declines um, the federal government uh, under President Obama in about, I think it was 2014, convened a pollinator task force and issued a pollinator protection plan and that New York State followed and released its pollinator protection plan in 2016. <clears throat> a, lot of the, a lot of the focus in that pollinator protection plan is on honeybees. Um, 
I don't think of honeybees as a conservation issue. I think of them as an agricultural issue. But the, the report did, um, did uh, require that the DEC would begin this multi-year evaluation of the native pollinator species to show the status and distribution of native pollinators and, and have management recommendations and, and a basis for conservation action. And we were funded to do that project. So starting in 2017, uh, we, um, we undertook the, um, the task of designing a statewide native pollinator survey. Around the same time, a little before, in 2015, New York State released its wildlife, its, its update, 10-year update to the Wildlife Action Plan. And that is a document that designates species of greatest conservation need uh, all over the state. And those range, again, from whales to frogs to beetles and birds. And for the first time, um, we nominated some bumblebees as a potential species of greatest conservation need. And in their um, ranking effort, in the state's ranking effort, the bumblebees soared to the top, soared to the top of that list, um, among the most imperiled species in all of New York State further documenting the need for a better understanding of, of many native pollinators. So the first thing we did was say, as I mentioned, we're not experts in pollinators and we, we you know, know a lot about some insect groups and just a little bit about others. And, and so let's see if we can get um, some experts together to help us design this project and, and even figure out which pollinators to focus on. So we, we assembled a great group of people. I, um, I'm so grateful to this this group who have, I'm um, including the, the DEC and, <clears throat> and, um, and uh, other state agencies, federal agencies and universities, um, people who have really contributed a lot to, um, to helping us design this study and we couldn't have done it without them. First thing we did when we, when we got together and had a series of phone calls and one in-person meeting was to figure out the goal of the project and, um, always a good idea is to figure out why you're executing a project. Well, we decided our goal was to determine the conservation status of a wide array of native insect pollinators in non-agricultural habitats. And there's a couple key words in there I want to point out in key phrases. So conservation status, um, we have something very specific in mind at Natural Heritage when we say that, and that's the S rank. We, um, we are, um, tasked with, as part of the NatureServe network and, and for as a service to the state, uh, determining um, S ranks. Those are ranks that range from S1 through S5 and, um, and are, are meant to be sort of a, a summation of the uh, imperiledness or, or security of different taxa. And, um, and sometimes that information feeds then into state listings, and, um, but it's not a one-to-one -one relationship uh, but we rank every species we get enough information for and have enough time for and have enough funding to rank. Uh, we try to rank with an S1 through S5. We did not have those ranks for anything but bumblebees, which we had gotten the funding to, to work on a few years before, maybe 2013 is when NatureServe was able to provide us funding to rank bumblebees. Before that, we didn't understand the conservation status of, of a wide variety of taxa. Native insect pollinators, um, so that's native as opposed to some of our uh, uh, non-natives like the honeybee. And so we, we put that in there to distinguish specifically that this is not a honeybee study. And non-agricultural we put in there because again, we are interested in the native insect fauna in, in more natural habitats. That doesn't mean that we're not interested in, in understanding which pollinators which native pollinators might use farms, might use agriculture or cities or suburbs. Um, we are, um, but our main focus is natural habitat types. And the calendar and the, the place marker here show that we started the formal study, as, as I mentioned, we, um, it was actually 2016, I remember now, that we first gathered our advisory committee and started designing the study. We had a bit of a pilot year in 2017, but the formal four-year study started in 2018. Um, and so we had a full field season in 2018, another one in 2019, and as Polly mentioned, the Central Pine Barrens Commission joined us uh, in, in starting to sample in 2019. 2020 is intended to be our final field year. Um, I will say that you should take that with a grain of salt in part because uh, wouldn't it be nice to have more funding to do another field season? And <laughs> wouldn't it be nice if we're allowed outdoors this summer? That uh, remains to be seen exactly how much travel and how much sampling we can accomplish 
at the moment, we're still planning for a full 2020 field season, but we understand that um, things are changing all the time. We gave ourselves a, almost a year to analyze the data and write it up and finish our report by the end of 2021, which was very smart of us, if I say so. One thing we wanted in our study is, is um, to make sure that we were representing all the major orders of pollinating insects. So um, there had been a lot of focus on, on bees and rightfully so, bees are, are understood to be the most important pollinators for, for many um, native plants. And, um, and so it made sense to have some focus on them and, and also the most research had been done on, on potential declines in these species. But we also wanted, thought it was important to recognize that there were other native insect pollinators that had not been given as much attention. In particular, those are the, the diptera, the flies, uh, lepidoptera, um, moths especially. Um, we're not really focused on butterflies and I can explain why in a little bit. And then coleoptera beetles, which are the, the oldest pollinators of, of um, flowering plants and, and still are important for, for a lot of species. So we wanted to represent all four of these major insect groups. And we, um, we chose three complementary survey approaches to do this. Um, one is, is um, surveys by biologists. So our funding from the DEC includes funding to pay for a field crew. And we have a field crew that goes around the state. Our initial dream was to have four field crews going around the state, but uh, we, we, um, we, we aimed high. And, uh, and so we were able to afford a, a crew they go around um, all over uh, New York State at different ecoregions and different times and, and conduct our sampling protocol, which I'll describe in a little bit. And that's a standardized protocol conducted by trained biologists. And then our own natural heritage staff also uh, conduct some of these surveys. We have a community science component and we thought from the beginning that it was important to understand, um, uh, well, important for several reasons, you know, important to engage the public as much as possible because uh, the more you can do that, the, um, the better buy-in you have for, uh, for uh, conservation efforts supporting these species. Uh, the more people we can, we can train and the more people um, we can spread this message to, the better. Um, so in this picture, that's, that's Erin and, uh, and she has led a lot of these workshops. Um, you all, one of her workshops with, um, with a variety of people, I don't know where this one was, but um, we've done maybe 15 workshops over the, over the few years so far. And there she is giving a presentation and it's a you know indoor classroom session followed usually by a field session. We're also spending a lot of time in museums and, and uh, databasing old records of pollinators. Um, all of our focal taxa, we're trying to get as good a database as we can of the historical distribution of these species so that we have some basis for comparison to tell whether, um, whether species might have declined. So we'll be able to compare our, our statewide efforts over the last few years to all the rest of history and see if we can pick up patterns in, in decline. That's a, that's a messy, uh, a messy um, data set. It will be a messy data set um, and, and the signals have to be pretty strong because of the nature of sporadically obtained historical data. Uh, we recognize that. We still believe strongly that we can get some um, uh, patterns if, if they are present. So these three approaches um, are, are uh, underlying the work and, and um, community science is really what I'm focused on today, although that's very broad. I'm not just talking about you know, non-scientists in the, in the public, but really anybody in, who might be a biologist or might not, but is in a state agency. We have a lot of partners who are, um, who are using this protocol around the state from the alpine environments of the Adirondacks to the Long Island Pine Barrens. And, um, and so, uh, we train these trainings are, are a mix of people who are just interested amateur biologists and people who are professional biologists, uh, but um, but are wanting to um, use this protocol in their work. So what have we done so far? All of us in that by all I mean all of all of the people who have contributed to this project, which is a lot of people now um, have accomplished about 150 site surveys. So using these uh, these protocols um, at 150 places all over New York. Those are the dots in two different years. Um, and those are eco regions underlying that, those dots. So we try to balance our sampling. Um, I'd make a joke about the points being socially distanced, but I think that socially, social distance jokes are, are played out at this point. So I won't make that joke. Um, so we're trying to balance these, um, 
these uh, points as much as possible and, and spread them out across the state and, and still represent the, the unique conditions of each of, the, each of these ecoregions well. About 15 workshops and agency trainings and the iNaturalist portion of the project has been a real success. We've um, I got these numbers from yesterday, um, almost 11,000 observations of, uh, of pollinators that are contributed specifically to our project. 828 species and 461 people have joined the project and submitted observations. I mentioned that we've had a student at SUNY ESF who, who did her master's on the project for the first couple of years and she graduated in December. So we're really proud of that collaboration. And, um, and we've spent a lot of time in museums and, and, um, and we, we are pioneers on using masks in our work. And there've been um, some really important findings I'd say right now. We have um, seven different rare bumblebee species that we have new locations for and a better understanding of their distribution. Uh, oil bees I'll talk about a little bit. There's these rare species that, that are, are really fascinating um, and, uh, and we've gotten some records from those. We've detected new records for the state, a new species for the state in, in the case of hoverflies or flowerflies. Um, rare bee flies are showing up in new places. We've got records for three rare moths and countless county records for, for all these taxa. So a really um, much better understanding of the distribution um, and, and eventually status than of, uh, of our focal taxa. So, Oh, here's an example of that. So Bombus terricola is a species that was proposed for federal listing. It's the yellow-banded bumblebee, and it's primarily a northern species. And um, we didn't have, I think we had just a handful of records over the last 20 years. It was not thought to be extirpated from the state, but it was considered to be quite rare. I'd say it's still probably a rare species. Um, and you notice this mismatch of 44 and 38, I guess the screenshot I got <clears throat> was older than the, the updated number, but we've gotten a lot of records for this species in New York. And so it's turning out that um, to be really important, this will be a species that we track in the natural heritage database and, and, um, and keep occurrence records for. And so just on iNaturalist alone, we've been able to document populations of this species. I mean, an individual bee isn't a population, but it's indicative of one. And, um, and so um, I think it's really, uh, really, to the credit of the iNaturalist community that they've been able to, um, to submit data and, and, um, and, uh, and help the conservation of this, um, this rare bumblebee. Just one of many examples. One much, much of what I'm gonna to describe today, pretty much all of what I'm, I'll describe in terms of methodology anyway, is in our participant handbook, which we put out two years ago. Um, and I'll acknowledge also Jeff Corser, who um, is a zoologist with Heritage, uh, who has contributed a lot to the, the methodology and has led the fly component of the project. Um, <clears throat> so we wrote this book, book <laughs> document in, uh, in 2018, and it's still available online. I think actually we sent it out with, for everybody too. And so a lot of this material is in there. If you um, miss something I've said, or undoubtedly I won't say something that I should have, and that'll be in the, in the book for uh, you to be able to, to read. And we outlined three main ways that we thought citizen scientists, and, and really I mean that um, to include um, partners who are not part of uh, the heritage program to contribute. Um, one is to be a photographer. And, um, and so we'll train, um, I'll, I'll demonstrate today how uh, uploading photos to iNaturalist goes um, for what's really for any purpose, but, um, but I'll use our project as an example. Um, an advantage of this, you can photograph without handling the insect. Um, so if you're if you're either worried about bee stings or worried about the the, the welfare of the of the insect, um, you know photography is is a great way to go. You don't have to have fancy camera equipment. You don't have to be an expert photographer. And I'll show you a couple examples where I took adequate photos and they can still uh, contribute data to the project. So it's a non-lethal method of contribution. Um, this is a still I think from Sam one of Sam Drogi's videos that I'll show you shortly. Um, and you could contribute just by netting insects. Um, usually it's, it's a lethal method. You could um, catch and release, and you could even net and catch and photograph and then release. Uh, but typically we, we net insects and then store specimens in, in the freezer and then, and then pin them uh, when they come out of their freezer. And then uh, we, we called um, 
this group of people, the bowlers, and, um, and that's the use of bowls filled with soapy water to catch and collect pollinators. So this is something you could do if you have a limited time and, um, and you just wanna put out bowls and then collect them at the end. And again, that's not something that requires really any skill whatsoever. It's just knowing, you know, having the equipment and knowing what to do with it. Um, and netting is, a, is, is more of a, um, a skilled exercise, but anyone can learn to do it, I think. But if all you're in, if you just want to know, you know, um, some of the bees that are that are using a natural area that that um, that you're interested in, bowls are a great way to do that. You won't catch everything there, and so these these methods are intended to be complementary because um, typically netting you get larger insects and bowls you get smaller insects. Um, I'll go through the the details of the protocol a little bit later, so um, I won't I won't list those here, but um, Again, you don't have to handle live insects if that's a concern for you. Um, and again, you would be storing the specimens properly, uh, usually in alcohol, and then um, washing and drying them and, and pinning them. And I'll just say, Polly, if, if you notice questions that come up in the, or Jade, if you notice questions that come up in the chat box that um, you want, you think would be relevant any time, I don't mind being interrupted with them. If you want to wait until a, you know, designated point, we can do that too. Just, just to point out that I don't mind if you jump in. Okay, there was one question from Evelyn, um, which I know you covered. I didn't know if that answered your question, Evelyn, when Matt went through the rankings um, related to the bees on the uh, rare animal list. Evelyn? Um, so Matt, the question that Evelyn had was um, twofold. What, if you're interested in data or collections of non-native organisms in addition to natives? I would say it depends on, the, on what non-natives we're talking about. So um, we are interested in um, broadly in certain focal taxa that I'll, that I'll describe in a little bit. So um, there are non-natives within some of those groups, not many, but there are some, and we are interested in documenting the distributions of those two. In, in short, it doesn't hurt to send us information, and if that information is in the, the form of iNaturalist observations or in the form of a spreadsheet of data that you have and, and, and you know, you've documented that you've um, identified things uh, and, and had them verified by, by experts if you're not an expert yourself, um, in, in the form of, uh, of specimens sent to us. It doesn't hurt to send that information to us. We, uh, we do have to prioritize what we process and pin and then send to our partners who are helping with the identification. So it's possible that we won't be able to give you a direct answer about uh, what it is you're sending. We're not, you know, we're not a lab to be able to do that. I know that's not what you're asking, but um, the point is, send us information by all means, and then if it turns out to be something that we're not interested in, we'll, um, we, we won't use it. But, um, but if you want to ask me specifically, I'll give you my email at the end anyway, and, and you can just reach out and ask me specifically what you have in mind. And then the second question Evelyn had was um, that there was not a lot of bees on your rare animals list. and. She inquired if that was because most populations are secure in the state level or because many populations are not well documented. And I think you went on to answer some of that, but I don't know if you want to cover that again. No, that, um, that's great. It, it's good to clarify actually that the, the latest version of what we call our rare animal status list is 2017. And that was before we started the pollinator project. So we, um, we have bumblebees on there now. And, and I think those are the only bees we have ranked and, um, and added to our rare animal list so far. Um, after this project is over, that list will look dramatically different. We will have new beetles, bees, flies, moths. Um, all of those will, will, um, will end up on the list where they might not have been there before because we're now understanding their conservation status for the first time. Anything else, Polly, for now? Those were the two questions. Okay, great. And Evelyn uh, said thank you as well. Okay, <laughs> great. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to assume everyone's read this at this point, the bee allergy slide. Erin Aaron, Aaron is 
kind enough to put this up and say, just, just a reminder that if you're considering participating in a way that requires you to handle live insects, um, you gotta know whether you're allergic to bees or not. Um, if you're not, I would recommend an allergy test. I mean, if you don't know, I would recommend an allergy test. Uh, I understand that getting tested for anything these days is not so easy, but um, uh, if you're not aware, um, then, then maybe be more cautious. Um, there are people who are so sensitive to bee stings, of course, that, that they could be killed by a bee sting. That's rare, but it is possible. Um, as a, a bit of a consolation, that's not the word. Uh, oh, let's make up a word. Um, <laughs> as a bit of a, to console you, to, um, boy, good morning, everybody. I'm still waking up, I guess. Um, can't come up with a word, but anyway, to make you feel a little bit better, I have been stung once in three to four years of handling hundreds and hundreds of bees now. So um, it's, it's rare. A lot of the small bees can't sting at all. Uh, some of them can sting, but you would barely feel it. Bumblebees can sting and, and do, and, uh, and it hurts. Um, I'm lucky enough not to be allergic to that, although I'm allergic to everything else in the world, so somehow I managed to escape being allergic to bees. Be aware of, of bee allergies, but also recognize that once you're, um, once you're uh, skilled in getting insects out of a net, uh, you, really don't have to, um, you really don't have to worry all that much. It does not happen often. <clears throat> a couple notes about insect collecting. Um, we did a, an atlas of um, dragonflies and damselflies uh, from 2004 to 2009. And in that project, um, we accepted some records just on the basis of somebody saying they saw, you know, they, re they reported on their data sheet, I saw a common green darner at this place at this time, and that was good enough for us. And we didn't require them to submit a photograph or, or a specimen for that. For other species, we did. We required a photograph, uh, or in some cases, we required a specimen because um, we didn't believe that the state of knowledge uh, was, was such that um, we could uh, automatically accept records just that were, that were brought to us without the physical evidence. And we decided for the pollinator project that that's the case for most of our target taxa. So in fact, all of our target taxa, we require photographs and, and um, and or specimens. Um, you will find that there are species that cannot be, um, that cannot be, um, excuse me, that cannot be identified from photographs. And so um, one of the reasons for these being complementary methods is that um, the iNaturalist part of our project is, is fantastic and I really value it. And I really value uh, the contributions of people who are, who are submitting photographs to the project. But it also means that there are some species that um, cannot be reported that way, uh, trust in a trustworthy way. And that's, and that's no fault of the observer. It's just that some um, of these require microscopic uh, identification. They require looking at parts of the bug that you can only look at when the bug is dead. Um, we are submitting all of our insect collections to museums. So um, our, our bees are, are primarily getting identified by experts at um, the Cornell uh, Insect Collection and, and Brian Danforth's lab, in bee lab there. Um, and then all, all of those will be accessioned into the Cornell Insect Collection, I should say. And, uh, and then our, um, our beetles and our flies are getting accessioned to the New York State Museum here in Albany. So um, these will be a resource into the future, just like we're now going to museums to look for um, historical records of a lot of, a lot of these taxa. So we couldn't do that if the specimens weren't, weren't there. And, um, and so we really value the, the, the collections for that purpose. And if it's properly labeled and, and assigned with its you know, date and location and, and other information that we ask for, it's, it's not just an insect on a pin, it's, it's a record. It's a, a, a trustworthy, verifiable record in the database and one that people can go back to and, and verify again in the future or, or um, help figure out if you know, species get split and lumped all the time. Uh, systematists make careers out of that. And so um, we are providing them with important um, documentation of, of uh, insects that were found at a certain time and a place. But we don't take this lightly, and, and I, I'm just going to point out that um, 
there's there's uh, there are ethical considerations with with killing insects, um, and and I don't take that lightly, and I don't think and my colleagues don't either. But you know we know insects are declining, and and so um, we don't just say well they're just they're just bugs. It's okay to to kill as many as we need for science. Well, we do it because uh, species many can't be identified alive or in photographs, as I mentioned. Um, this duplicates a little bit of the slide before. Apologies, I combined a couple of presentations here, but uh, the the new bullet here is that. Um, there have been studies that have shown that um, there, the amount of collecting that we do when we sample a place has no impact on the, on the insect populations. Um, so you can collect 100 bees from a site and there are thousands more out there that you're not touching and, and it does not really affect their, their populations to any degree that's measurable. So um, even though that might make you not make individuals feel more comfortable with it, and there are people who do not want to kill insects, and we totally respect that, and we encourage them to participate using uh, photographic methods. All right, good place for a, a brief breather anyway, if not, not even 10. That, it's up to you, Polly, if you think we're ready for a full break or just like a little breather, because I'm going to dive into um, talking about our focal taxa and some of the biology of our focal taxa. I, I leave it up to you, Matt, on what your needs are. So if you want to break, um, go ahead and take one. I'm sure everyone else would appreciate a quick break to get refill their coffee. Or what, how about if we go for another 15 minutes or so and then aim for 10 o'clock? I'll find a good stopping point around 10 a.m. and take a break then. Is that okay? Yeah, that's fine. Okay, great. Let's do that. All right, pollinator biology and taxonomy. Um, Here's the key message of this slide. Bugs have parts. And I'm showing you a diagram of a bee and some of its parts labeled. And I'm showing you a diagram of a longhorn beetle with some of its parts labeled. And the point of this slide is not to, to walk you through all those different parts for any particular organism, but just to make the, um, the pitch that if you really want to understand how to identify any of these focal taxa, you need to learn their parts. And most guides, um, to these species when they exist uh, are very good about showing you a, a diagram of the anatomy of the, of the insect. And, uh, and the more of that you can learn, um, the better you'll understand some of these complex keys as you get into, you know, really um, di uh, dichotomous or other keys that, that, um, that tell you you've got to, you know, measure the distance between the scutum and the tegula. Well, then you'll know, you'll know what those parts are if you, if you, um, if you have studied those diagrams. So I'm not gonna go much into anatomy here uh, today, partly because it's not my thing and partly because we wouldn't have time and, and everyone would fall asleep very quickly. But I'm gonna talk about some key characteristics of, of different, different groups. And, and so, uh, <clears throat> pardon me, here's some key characteristics of bees. Well, um, I found this um, set of, of slides that helps us determine the difference between bees, flies, and wasps, uh, because we, we get that question a lot, and, and it's something, to be honest, that I hadn't really thought about myself uh, before um, about three or four years ago. Um, but I like the way these, this was laid out. So, so for bees, um, you know, there's, there's, a piece, there's things about the body shape, um, cylindrical abdomen and thorax that you, need to, uh, that you can pay attention to. Often they have pollen carrying hair, which are called scopa on their legs. You can see this on the honeybee here. Um, they have long antenna, at least compared to flies. Um, the kink in the elbow part of the antenna, that was new to me when I read this slide. Um, the eyes are at the side of the face. So here's the eyes of this bumblebee. Here's the eyes of this bee. And we'll compare that to fly eyes, which are more toward the front of the face. There are two pairs of wings and they're often on the back at rest and shorter than the body. Two pairs, so four wings. And, um, and that's in comparison, again, to diptera, which means two-winged insect, and that's a fly. So you will see flies that look like bees, but if you can count the wings, uh, which you can't always do, if you can count the wings, that will tell you, you know, whether it's a fly or a bee. And I guess the head shape is distinct compared to um, a, a fly head. So let's, let's, look at the, let's look at these guys. So flies, eyes are large, round, and cover much of the face. So here are fly eyes. They're not as much on the side. They're more toward the front. Here are the eyes. And we'll see some other pictures later, and you can look for these features um, then. 
um, the eyes are so big and some male flies that they touch each other. So, um, and that never happens in bees. The antenna of, of flies is much shorter. You can see this tiny little antenna there and this tiny little antenna here. Um, and so that's another key characteristic. Um, body shape, highly variable. So, um, it, you know, I don't, I don't put as much faith in this. One pair of wings, two wings only. And that's, um, and often they're held differently um, at, at a 45 degree angle, uh, a round and large head. But some of them mimic bees and wasps. So you gotta watch out. And then how do you tell a, particularly a bee from a wasp, right? Remember that bees and wasps are, are, are both hymenopterans. Um, and so they're, they're more closely related. Um, and this is tricky. So th um, there are some uh, insects out there that um, I, you know, I, I see and I have no idea if it's a bee or a wasp. Um, and there's some that are quite obvious. So, you know, this, this is pretty obviously a wasp just from the shape and the, the, the long skinny abdomen. Um, the waist, if you can see the waist here is the, you know, the wasp waist is kind of a famous characteristic for wasps. Um, they don't always have this. Bees sometimes do have this. So it's not as, as uh, distinct as, as the difference between bees and flies or wasps and flies. Um, they'll also have their eyes on the side of the head, just like, just like bees do, and long antenna, two pairs of wings, so four wings. Um, some have a visible ovipositor, and they can, um, human on, if I'm pronouncing that right, wasp, um, which you've probably seen, which is scary to death, but it's not a stinger, it's, a, it's an ovipositor. I've also heard the de vague description that, um, that uh, wasps look more militaristic. So if you look at them from the front, they just they kind of look meaner. And they are meaner, and, uh, and bees just look fuzzy and friendly. That's not a scientific a description, though, <laughs> so we don't use that very much. All right, back to bees. Oh, there's another version of this online you've seen probably, uh, Comprehensive Guide to Yellow Stripey Things. Um, <clears throat> and so uh, there's, um, this is meant to just show you some of the common bees, wasps, and flies that are out there. There's a more profane version of this available too, but I'm showing you the, the, PG, um, the PG version of it. Um, and a bumblebee is a flying panda. Anyway, you can, <laughs> you can see this on the, on, on the PDF of the, of the presentation. I won't read them all, but yellow jacket is just a jerk. You know, uh, the cicada killer is pretty terrifying. These are all true, but it also does show you some, some real characteristics to help you with some of these um, common insects. It's another cartoon, just to um, remind you, all the insects we're talking about undergo complete metamorphosis. So that's, they go from egg to larva to pupa to adult, and bees are, are, um, are no exception to that. And we'll talk about life cycles just a little bit um, with the bumblebee because it's, it's so interesting. Bees, oh, one thing I didn't mention is that there are um, 416 species of bees known from New York State. That's information that was compiled by Brian Danforth um, of, the, uh, of Cornell University and one of our key partners on this project. Uh, 416 known, known bee species for, for New York. And, um, and they exhibit a variety of kinds of behaviors in natural histories. So often we think of bees as you know, these eusocial or truly social bees. Honeybees are, are an example, bumblebees where there's a queen and there's workers and there's soldiers and, um, and, uh, and they all live together in the same nest. But that is a rarity. And, um, <clears throat> so these are the showy ones? No, they usually show. Just a reminder to mute your line, please, if, uh, if you can, thanks. Um, there are semi-social bees that use the same nest but do not interact and do not have this population structure the way that the eusocial bees do. There are communal bees that are solitary bees that live, you know, the queens, um, the queens are, are single females that, that um, get their eggs fertilized and, and build nests by themselves, but the nests share the same entrance. And then there are aggregations, um, and I'll show you a picture of that in, in a minute, where, where um, maybe because the habitat is, is, is limiting, um, there's a bunch of nest entrances in the same location. But, um, but they're not sharing nests. And then there are solitary bees and the purely solitary bees where the bee females build and maintain their own nests. And this is the majority of New York's bees. I think it's about two thirds of New York's bees. So here's some examples, bee nests. Here's some, an aggregation of, of holes. These are individual bee nests. 
Um, you also see that here in this trunk. So the variety of substrate types, you know, a lot are ground nesters, many are ground nesters. Some are dead wood nesters and some are, are you know, twig nesters like this. A variety of kinds of um, nesting substrates for our native bees. One of the key tasks we had when we assembled our advisory committee and started to talk about the project was which pollinators would we focus on? We knew that there were thousands and thousands of, of pollinating insects and, and um, the DEC did not give us direction on which ones to, um, to make a focus and we knew we couldn't address them all. Um, so we selected a group of bees that we thought, and this is true for the other taxa as well, that we selected groups that, that we thought would be um, the primary concern was that, um, that we thought there might be conservation concerns with some of them, but we didn't really understand their status very well. Um, so we expected there would be some rare species, some common species, um, but we had never, you know, developed S ranks for them. And um, we also wanted them to be appealing to citizen scientists. So uh, we chose, in some cases, we chose taxonomic groups that uh, were, were um, subjectively prettier or more appealing or easier to identify. Um, and, and, uh, and we wanted groups where the taxonomy was stable and, and even experts um, would not have to take days and days to identify single specimens. In the case of bees, we settled on bumblebees and longhorn bees, about 10 of which are considered, are thought to be rare. This is based on some of Brian Danforth's and others' work. Um, well, we haven't documented that yet with this statewide effort. That's what the statewide effort is partly about. Mining bees, about 18 of those are thought to be rare. Leaf cutter and mason bees, about 10 rare, and all five of the oil bees that, um, that are considered rare species. So um, just a quick note on the, on the handouts you got. Um, there's, a, there's one that says target bees, target beetles, target flies, target moths. And, um, and those are from different databases and different formats. And so apologies for, for the messiness of that. But um, in the case of target bees, it is only the bees suspected to be rare, not all the ones within the focal groups we'll be talking about. I think for all the other focal taxa, it's all the ones because all the, the ones in those, in those um, families, subfamilies, genera, because we don't know really which, we don't suspect even which ones are rare or common. So now, um, focal taxon by taxon, I think I have about um, maybe eight or 10 slides for bees and then um, I'm going to go through some of the biology and taxonomy of these um, individuals. And I think I might get through a couple of bee slides or two, and then we'll take a, a short break. Um, bumblebees are, you know, they're, they're sort of the, <clears throat> the poster child for our native bee that's in trouble. Um, there are 14 extant bumblebee species in New York. I believe there are four uh, that are now considered extirpated, including the rusty patched bumblebee, which is uh, now federally listed. Um, used to be uh, in many places in New York, has not been documented since 1999, including in our study. We haven't found them yet in the first couple of years. Bumblebees are large and hairy, they're eusocial, um, and they're generalists. So they forage on a lot of different plants and they, they buzz pollinate, which means they can shake the pollen out of, a, um, out of an anther if they feed on the pollen, um, which often they do, um, and, and they can um, they can shake that pollen out by vibrating their bodies. It's really worth seeking out a video on that um, online if you can find it. They carry pollen on their legs. Here's the scopa that we talked about before where, um, where pollen accumulates on the bee. And so often you can see bumblebees with you know, large packets of orange or, or yellow pollen just clinging to, the, to their legs. And they're cool weather adapted. So you'll see these guys out in, in conditions where you might not see other species. And, um, so they can be out when it's you know, 60 degrees out as long as it's sunny um, and, uh, and they can warm themselves up by basking. And their life cycle is really interesting. So um, the queen bumblebees emerge in April and find a nest site. And so anything you see flying around now, and, uh, and I think that's still true even on Long Island, that's going to be true that any bumblebees you see flying around are queens and they are looking for a new nest site. They might be feeding along the way, but often you'll, um, often you'll find them just scouting the ground, scouting, um, you know, looking around for a place to nest. Um, they lay their eggs, and then the workers 
uh, forage while the queen produces more young. That happens all through the summer. The males and the new queens leave the nest to mate in the late summer, and then everybody dies except the queen. And the queens overwinter <clears throat> and then start come out again um, to start a new nest. So think about, uh, you know, in uh, just a month ago, and actually now too, that's all the, the only bumblebees in our part of the world uh, that exist <laughs> are queens. And that's, that's it. Everybody else is, is waiting to be born and, and live their few months of life and then um, to contribute to the, the uh, bumblebee gene pool. Another group in this family that we're focused on is the longhorned bees. Melisodes is the genus, and, and of course they're called longhorned because of the long antenna, which of course are horns. These are ground nesting solitary bees. They sleep communally, which is just adorable. So I, I saw, actually saw a good slide I'd like to steal just yesterday on a talk that, um, that showed these guys um, curled up in a flower after fighting all day over the, you know, over the, uh, the pollen or, or, in, or nectar in a flower. Then they curl up and, and sleep at night and all snuggled up. It's really cute. Um, and many are, are sunflower specialists, so that's often late summer, later summer things, asters um, coming out in late summer and, and even fall. Let's do a couple more bee slides. <clears throat> the mining bees are so-called because they are ground nesters. And so they, they make uh, ground nests. They're, they're mining, I guess. Um, and uh, and these are the um, Andrenids, and specifically the genus Andrena. It's the largest, this is the largest family and largest genus in, um, in New York State. Uh, they're thought to be 18 rare species in both uh, the genus Andrena and Calliopsis. So they're solitary ground nesting bees. Um, the way you tell them from, uh, from other kind of lookalike species is these um, Facial fovea, and the fovea is a, is a depression that you can't see in this picture, but it's between the eye and the middle of the face. It's a little depression that some um, groups of bees have and some don't. And in some groups that have them, they're fuzzy or hairy, and in some groups that have them, they're shiny. And, and so again, these are characteristics that you can't see in the field for the most part. And so telling these guys apart um, requires a lot of experience with them. Um, if you're not, if you're not going to have them as a specimen under a microscope, then some people can tell them to genus at least from um, just from all their experience looking at you know these dark these dark insects with um, with particular features or particular body shapes that they get used to. Some are specialists on different host plants, and and there's there's good resources I could point you toward for um, for figuring that out if you're interested too. Another group within the Andrenids I mentioned, Calliopsis. So here's an example of um, the facial fovea. Here's a diagram. And again, this is something to look at under a microscope or a hand lens at least. Um, so here's the eye and here's the, here's the fovea and it's shiny and calliopsis and hairy and, and andrena. That's how you tell those two genera apart. Uh, but the mining bees are small, dark, <clears throat> and, um, and, um, and generally have the same body shape but, um, and they're solitary ground nesters. Leaf cutter bees. Um, I so wanted this to be pronounced mega chili. I really did, but it's mega uh, and it's the family mega These are cylindrical chunky bees. Um, they are called leaf cutter bees because they do cut leaves um, just like leaf cutter ants that you've probably seen on all kinds of nature documentaries or in your visits to Puerto Rico or other parts of the tropics. Leaf cutter bees do cut, um, cut leaves and bring those to line their nests, bring those little pieces of leaf to line their nests. Um, Another cool thing about um, these bees is they carry pollen on their abdomen. So look how hairy it is down here. That they don't, um, they have long hair on their legs and they might collect pollen there too, but I don't believe they have scopa in the same way that, that bumblebees and, and, um, and um, honeybees do. And so most of the pollen is collected on, um, on the belly. So these large mandibles, here's a good example. You can see these large mandibles and they used to cut leaves. And they're all kinds of nesters, wood, cavity, and ground. Also within the megachylidae are the osmia bees. These are mason bees. And they're called mason bees because they, they use mud to build partitions between their nests. Um, what else can I point out here? I don't need to read all of this, but there, this is another group that if you're interested in, in um, agriculture and, and 
providing pollination services using native bees, mason bees are the ones that are, that are often domesticated and, and trucked around um, in addition to honeybees. It's a, it's a much smaller part of the industry, but, but they, are, they are used that way. They also carry, carry pollen on their abdomen and sometimes on their face, because well, I mean, they're so incredibly fuzzy and cute. I guess I'm gonna finish the bees and then we'll take a little break. So oil bees, um, when you talk to bee biologists, this is the group they're all excited about because you almost never see them. And um, it's the family Melididae and, uh, and Macropus has three species. All of them are rare in New York. They're very rarely collected. They're specialists and collect flower oils from native loosestrifes, Melissa Um I was on Long Island last year and had a big patch of native Lysimachia quadrifolia and never saw one of these bees. <laughs> and they were in flower and they were all, you know, it seemed perfect and I never, I did not find any bees on them at all. So it's not that they're, they're everywhere that the native blue stripes are, but that's a good, um, if you know of a place where there's native blue stripes and you're out in June uh, or maybe even early July, it's certainly worth a look for these bees. Uh, they're black, they get really fluffy hind legs and uh, again, solitary ground nesting bees. And the other one in this group is Melitta, um, and they're specialists on vaccinium. So deerberry in particular is, is a known host plant for, um, for Melitta. So they look like an Andrina, um, dark and skinny, uh, but they don't have facial fovea. So if you happen to catch one and you can look with a hand lens, you would see that they don't have that little depression between the eye and the, and the center of the face. And last, um, there are other bees in New York that we're not uh, focusing on. And when I say we're not focusing on them, our sampling methods tend to catch them all. Um, what we have to prioritize is the identification because that takes so much time. And our partners at Cornell are, are fabulous at it and they're world experts on this, um, but they can't go through everything. So we retain those specimens and we hope that somebody will come along and say, I really want you know, to identify all the sweat bees from your project. Um, and, and that would be great. Um, we're not able to do that under our project, but we do get them and we, and we have them an eye naturalist and we have specimens that are sort of waiting to be identified, but um, our funding didn't allow us to, to do everything. There are a couple other genera within the Andrina and the Apidae, Andrinidae and Apidae and Megachylidae. There's a bunch of other genera that we're not focusing on. And then two whole families of bees that we're not touching on, the cellophane bees, Calididae, and the Helictidae, which are the sweat bees. And those are familiar to many of you, these metallic green and green blue bees that are beautiful, but impossible to identify apparently, even for experts, there's a genus of them called Dialectus that, um, that makes bee biologists uh, lose their minds. Why don't I, yeah, let me get through this. <laughs> I keep thinking I'm done and then I'm not. I'll get through, I think it's two more slides on bees. Um, touching on the non-native honeybee, and I mentioned um, honeybee, um, if you hear honeybee conservation as a, a, in, in a, a sentence together, uh, feel free to, well, be polite, but you could roll your eyes a little bit or you, <laughs> you, could, um, you could at least you know, make a skeptical face. Um, honeybee, um, honeybee declines are an agricultural problem, not a conservation problem. They are not about the conservation of native biodiversity, right? So um, they are important agricultural um, pollinators because we have designed agriculture around them. And so um, they, um, they're used to pollinate crops um, and they're necessary probably to pollinate a lot of the crops that are not native to New York. But a lot of the crops that we grow um, that, that are native to New York, like apples, uh, it appears that native pollinators can do just as good or better a job than uh, bringing in non-native honeybees. And Brian Danforth, again, research has, has shown a lot of this. Um, <clears throat> so a quick note about their identification, um, again, four wings, um, they have a, a particular cell on their wing, this marginal cell. Some people claim they can see that with their naked eye. If the bee holds still, I can't, uh, but, but the shape of the bee and the coloration become distinctive the more. There's a fair bit of variety in the coloration, but the, the shape and, and the coloration do uh, become distinctive the more you look at them, torpedo shaped striped abdomen covered with hairs, orange brown to very dark. And that's, that's the coloration variation I was talking about. Again, they have pollen baskets on their hind legs where they, where they carry pollen. Um, so the other thing about, about non-native bees, I think 
um, I love, you know, I love honey and, um, and I think I'm sure many of you do too. And I, and I think it's a valuable ag agricultural product. Um, however, um, we have to be pretty careful about high density beekeeping and, um, and how it might impact our natural systems. I've been in plenty of natural meadow um, where I expect to see a lot of native species and all I see are honeybees. And it's probably because there's somebody keeping a whole lot of hives you know, right over the fence so that I can't see. And, and the bees are coming to the natural area to forage and very likely out competing the natives and possibly spreading disease. So there's been a bunch of research recently that was you know, my own anecdote, um, but then recently I've been made aware of a lot of research that's showing that um, as honeybees increase, and that's, that's all this is, is just showing kind of abundance of honeybees um, uh, based on the number of colonies within 500 meters. This was, uh, I forget where this study was done, um, but it's relevant to here. Um, the numbers of wild pollinators decline. That's not cause and effect, that's correlation, right? But it's a pretty strong correlation and it's, um, and there are patterns that have been documented in other places um, and more and more research is coming out showing the, the potential danger of, of uh, wild beekeeping um, in large, you know, that doesn't mean backyard hives. We're not really talking about that. We're talking about large uh, high density beekeeping and its impacts on adjacent natural systems appear to be pretty significant. I'm gonna stop, I'm gonna jump for a second. Let's see if um, I can do this adequately. I saw a question on the chat about the specialist bees and, and where we can find that information. And so I'm gonna point you to a website and make sure, could somebody jump on the chat and let me know if you're seeing the website or if you're still seeing my PowerPoint screen. PowerPoint screen, okay, thanks. Um, Now you should be seeing my website, the website, not my website. Great. All right, so this is a, a great website, jaredfowler.com. I didn't put this in the slideshow, but um, um, but it's uh, Sam Drogi again from the USDS. I uh, worked with um, this composer and and um, and uh, bee enthusiast uh, to talk about um, specialist bees. And so I'm just scrolling down to show, you know, this is long list of native plants that they want you to, to plant to get pollen specialist bees around. And um, they say about 25% of them are pollen specialists. Anyway, I'll let you explore that on your own time. Um, these are just some examples right at the top. Macropus is one we talked about. Um, Melisodes is a longhorn bee, uh, Andrina, and a, and a Calides. So uh, Calides are not our focal taxa, but still are of interest and, um, and might be of interest to you. So check that out when you get a chance. And now I will jump back to PowerPoint. And we'll talk about flies. <clears throat> Excuse me. So um, flies are, you know, no, nobody likes flies. <laughs> They're, it's kind of sad um, because uh, it turns out that a lot of them are really ecologically important. And you might have even known that, you know, that, that even the ones that eat gross stuff probably are serving an important ecological role as decomposers. And, um, and there are a lot of flies that aren't disgusting, it turns out, and a lot of flies that are really um, quite fascinating and quite important pollinators. So second, secondly, uh, secondarily to bees, uh, they're considered to be the, the, the next most important pollinators. And, um, and in particular, um, we're focusing on, on two groups of the focal flies, uh, of, of flies, excuse me. Um, one is the bee flies, this is out of order from how I'm going to talk about them, but there are um, 10 species of, of, um, of uh, bee flies that, that um, are in our focal group. And, um, and then hover flies, also called flower flies. And uh, there are about 260 odd known from New York State. And we're focused on a subset of those that I'll talk about in a little bit. So let's, let's talk about flies. So here's, again, the hover flies, also called flower flies. Um, it's the family Surfidae. And you can see from this photo that a lot of them are bee mimics. Um, <clears throat> and um, and uh, bee and wasp mimics. So these are all flies we're looking at here. So remember that eyes toward the front, and in this case, I think even touching. Um, but look, it's got that wasp waist like a, um, like a true wasp does. Um, it will only have two wings. 
Um, sometimes you can see that well on a live insect, sometimes you can't. Uh, but again, um, and these have a little bit longer antenna than you would expect for flies compared to these tiny antenna that most flies have. So a lot of variability there, um, but um, you know, the, eye, the eyes have it, if you will. The, the eyes will, will give it away most of the time if you, if you can't tell from some of the other features. So they're bee mimics and they're, and they're um, bee and wasp mimics and they're, they're um, presumably um, have evolved to mimic bees and wasps for predator protection and, and so things will be afraid of them. Um, thinking that that they can get stung. Um, within this group, you know, these have been shown to be really important pollinators, as I mentioned, and there's a lot of very common species. In fact, um, uh, I think a study from Europe showed recently that uh, this one little group of of, uh, of surfids was by far uh, the the the, um, the biomass of of those insects visiting flowers outweighed that of bees by um, by a lot. Um, and so there's these tiny little Surfids um, in the genus Toxomerus uh, that are um, whose common name I'm forgetting right now, but um, I might show you a picture of that. <coughs> Pardon me. Um, uh, that are really um, common flower fl common visitors to to a lot of flowers. And if you spend some time looking and just see what look like little gnats, you know, visiting these flowers, and you look a little closer and realize, oh, these are these are actually little little hoverflies or flower flies. We're focused on a, a particular subset of those. Um, that, uh, that are old growth forest or late successional forest uh, dependents. And we chose those in part because, you know, they serve two important ecological roles. One is decomposers. Their larvae are, are often um, in dead wood. So these are called saprozylic species. They're ones that are, that are uh, dependent on dead wood. There's a lot of beetles in that group too. But the saprozylic flies um, will uh, be larvae in, in, uh, in dead wood and then and sometimes rot holes in trees and and um, and other tree cavities um, in in water. Sometimes sometimes they're aquatic because they're in these little puddles and tree holes. Uh, and then sometimes just in in the dead wood itself. And as they emerge into adulthood, then um, they serve as pollinators for spring ephemeral plants in the forest floor. So uh, the, two important ecological roles uh, that that these species play, and and um, some of them are are very good indicators of of older growth forests, which we have a fair bit of in, um, especially in the Adirondacks and Catskills, also Allegheny State Park and some other parts of the state. Um, so that's the group we're focused on in our project. Generally speaking, we're interested in documenting all the surfids we can, uh, but we have certain focal taxa that, that we'll have to spend the majority of our time uh, analyzing data and, and identifying specimens of. Let's see. So fo the focal surfids, again, were deciduous forest habitats, especially mature ones with spring ephemerals in the understory, like in this picture here. Um, most of the focal taxa are active in June. Um, they find flyways on ecotones. So we have a special effort um, with uh, using malaise traps with SUNY Cobleskill. Carmen Greenwood and, and her students at SUNY Cobleskill um, have been helping us set up and monitor malaise traps, which are uh, which are like tents that, that uh, trap insects into a collecting jar. And they're setting these up on ecotones between old growth forests and, and some other habitat type, which the flies use as, as flyways. Uh, and, um, and we're documenting a lot of our focal taxa that way. They also are known to hilltop, uh, which appears to be, I think, a, a breeding, um, sort of a breeding aggregation. They'll, they'll come up to the highest point in the land and, and sometimes they're caught up there even though that's not anywhere near their foraging or, or breeding habitat. How do you tell a hoverfly versus another fly um, with a microscope? They have what's called a spurious vein on their wing and there it is. It's a vein that starts and then stops again and I guess this is the Latin vena spuria. It sort of sounds like if you didn't know what the Latin name was it's what you would make up for the name spurious vein but I, I trust it. I think that's actually the spurious vein, vena spuria. And again, you're not going to see that with your naked eye. I can barely see it with a hand lens or a microscope myself, but people who have learned uh, to distinguish surfids from other flies um, swear to me that this is the way to tell them apart. I also want to talk about bee flies because um, if you take nothing else out of this morning's presentation, um, note that you heard the phrase cutest fly for the first time uh, in your life. Um, is that the cutest fly you've ever seen or what? Come on, look at it. They're like little teddy bears. 
um, this group of um, of, uh, of flies um, are a lot of them are rare, not including this one, which is Bomb Bombylius major, the the, um, the greater bee fly. This is the most common one in this genus. I actually don't think this is a member of the of the same genus Bombylius, but um, but again, so fuzzy I couldn't not include them. These are pictures from my naturalist from our project that that were submitted to our project of other uh, bee flies in New York State. And so you can see this is a pygmy bee fly, which is a rare species. Um, and, and you can see, I forget which one this is, sorry, I think it's also Bombylius major. But you can see that they're differently shaped from, um, from the other flies and from bees. They're called bee flies because they're fuzzy, but they have, um, again, two wings and they're swept back. They look like a fighter jet to me. So you can see that on this, on this bee in the upper left and this really long proboscis uh, that they use to feed on nectar. Their larvae though are parasitoids of other insects. So they're actually um, you know, parasitizing bees in their nests and beetles in their nests or in their in their larval um, burrows, and um, and and then as adults, they're they're important pollinators and, and nectar feeders. Really cool group of flies. Beetles. Um, we had a lot of choices on what to focus on uh, when we thought about which beetles we would include in our project, and and um, because there were I think some odd. Um, some 20 odd families of beetles, you know, we're all in the order Coleoptera. And as you probably know, that's the most diverse order of insects and the most um, beetles are by far the most diverse group of organisms of, of animals on the planet. Um, and, <clears throat> and so we had a lot of choices. There are a lot of pollinators in, in the, within the beetles. Um, we settled on ones that, again, we thought would be of citizen science appeal or, or you know, sort of broad um, aesthetic appeal for people and, and ones that people could get excited about. Um, and we settled on the longhorn beetles for that reason. They're flashy, they're, they're large enough. Uh, they're, there's not just one, one you know, 99 year old guy in a basement in a museum in Kansas who knows how to identify them, which is the case for some of these tiny, tiny uh, flower. There's like the ant-like flower beetles and some of these other tiny beetle groups that um, we didn't think would make a good fit for this project. Um, and I'm doing a lot of the identification of the beetles myself, and I am not a coleopterist, so I'm learning as I go, and this is a group I thought was, was more tractable. <clears throat> we don't know anything really about the commonness and rarity of these beetles, except what we're learning for, through our museum visits and, and the project so far. In addition to the flower longhorns, which I'll show you some more pictures of, uh, the hairy flower scarabs, which is a great name, but this group of, small group of scarab beetles um, that are also quite fuzzy and, and um, visit flowers regularly. <clears throat> so the flower longhorns were in the family Cerambicidae, that's the longhorn beetles, and a subfamily Lepturini, which is the, the flower longhorns. So they're robust, which means they're kind of chunky, you know, they look sturdy, uh, most of them, with long antennae, and that's the long horn. Um, they, um, they stridulate, that means they, um, they chirp, and, and I've never heard it myself. I keep reading about it, I keep waiting to hear it, but apparently um, they, can be, um, they can be made to chirp under stress. And I believe that's also a, a breeding sound for them. Many of the larvae are wood boring. So um, within the longhorn beetles, you've probably heard of the Asian longhorn beetle, which of course is an invasive species that we do not want in New York State. We have in New York State, we don't really want it because it is wood boring and, and destroys native trees that have not evolved with that beetle. Uh, but most of the wood boring beetles are native. Uh, they might be considered destructive to, uh, to timber producers, but they are native and belong here and don't, um, and don't erupt and invade the way that, that non-natives do. And then the adults feed on nectar and pollen. So, and again, this is a, you know, two important ecological roles in terms of um, decomposition and then pollination as adults. And their eggs are laid in the crevices of wood and, and wounds in the bark. A lot of the pictures I should say that I'm showing you, I, they're various sources. Some are just from the internet at large and Google images, but many are from the iNaturalist portion of our project. Some of them are, are my own photos. Um, I haven't been great about labeling all of them, so I apologize, but if you do want to use any of those photos, please just contact me and I'll, I'll sleuth out their source and, and, um, and get them to you. This is one from uh, a, a great um, friend and citizen scientist, uh, Stick LePan, who lives in the Adirondacks and 
and gives us all sorts of great sightings. So here's some other flower longhorns. Um, this is uh, on the far right is uh, an elderberry longhorn beetle and it's quite large. It's probably, um, it's about, a, the body is about an inch long. So picture then the, the, the antenna being another inch or even more. Um, it's quite large beetle and uh, there are rare species out west. The valley elderberry longhorn beetle was my graduate advisor studied and, and um, it's a, a rare species of riparian areas in, in California, a rare subspecies of, of uh, elderberry longhorn beetle. But here they're reasonably common, <coughs> but you don't see them very often. <coughs> Pardon me. And there's a, a lot of variety in this group too. So here's one that um, Guarotes is the genus for this and it, it's a very different shape from a lot of these other lepterine serambicids. You can see the tapered body shape that a lot of these guys have, the more common, um, I don't know, the more common body shape for these species. Um, and then there's there's funny ones like this that look like a shield bug or, or a stink bug, but it's actually a, a, a lepterine longhorn beetle. The hairy flower scarabs, so we're in the scarab beetles or dung beetles. Um, and then there's a genus called Trichiotinus, which is a uh, which is the hairy flower scarabs. And you can see how hairy they are. And so that makes them good pollinators because they're visiting flowers and, um, and, and then transferring that pollen around. So um, a variety of colors. Um, there's some common species, some rare, and we have five species in New York. Um, Aaron advertised too that, um, that uh, you can use a beading pad if you, if you aren't using a net, um, there are, um, or like a sheet of canvas with, uh, with sticks for a frame or at least a support and, and you can um, beat vegetation against it and beetles will drop out and, and can be collected or photographed from, the, from that canvas. Um, it's one way to get, um, to get these bugs that, that they're not, um, if you don't see them on flowers, if you're not looking on flowers or netting. Many of these can be identified by photo and so this is true of <clears throat> both the beetles and the moths. The primary identification method for a lot of these is photograph. Um, unlike the bees and the flies, uh, which we really need specimens for, I would suggest that, and, and we do accept and collect our own specimens of, of beetles. We don't really do that with moths. We have um, some moth collected, but the beetles and moths um, are great targets for photography and, and you can identify 99% of the individuals just, just from photographs. So speaking of moths, um, <clears throat> we, um, we have two families um, of moths that are included. One of them is, is the sphinx or hawk moths in the family Sphingidae, uh, 47 species. Not all of those are actually pollinators. I'll talk about them in a little bit more. Um, and then within the noctuids, um, it's uh, the genus Shinia, it's a flower moths. Um, and, and so anything called flower something, we kind of had to choose that, right? First though, let's have a review of moth versus butterfly and in the Lepidoptera, that's the order we're talking about. Um, so here's some comparisons of moth to butterflies, just as a reminder. Um, and again, taking things from the internet has its uh, pluses and minuses. Um, moths are active during the night. Well, yes, <laughs> mostly, <laughs> but not exclusively. Um, so, and there are day flying moths, as you, as you probably all know, we'll see the hummingbird, um, hummingbird sphinx moths, hummingbird hawk moths uh, are, are day flyers, a lot of the shinias are, and there are many other species of, of uh, day flying moths, but probably 90% of moths or even more are, are nocturnal. Butterflies are though pretty active during the day. I don't really know of any butterflies that are out at night. Um, I could be wrong about that again, um, but, um, but I'm not aware of any. Butterflies have clubbed antennae. So look at, you know, I'm gonna get my cursor back, a little ball on the end of the antenna and moths don't have that. Moths often have feathery, feathery antenna. Moths wings are stuck together. And, um, and, and that um, is, is what keeps them at rest. They're on their backs versus the butterflies that are folded over their backs. Um, and, it, and it affects their flight patterns too. And that's one of the reasons moths look so erratic when they fly even more so than, than butterflies. Butterflies are usually more vividly colored than moths. That's probably true, but I actually think that moths over, overall um, have some extremely striking um, coloration and patterns and, um, and some of the most beautiful insects around. All right. So sphinx moths or hawk moths in, in the family Sphingidae. 
These are large insects. Um, for the most part, this is a hummingbird sphinx moth, again, a day flyer. Um, this might be a, it's also called a clear wing. Um, and this might be a snowberry clear wing. I'm not sure. There's, there's three species of this group. One of them is rare, the, the graceful, what's it called, the graceful um, clear wing. And then there's the hummingbird clear wing and the snowberry clear wing. And the best way to tell them apart is the color of their legs. Uh, there's some other body colorations that are different too, but the color of their legs is the key way to, to distinguish them. Which again, if you get the right photograph, you can tell those apart too. Um, really long proboscis, sometimes you know, unrolls for several inches to stick down into a, a, a deep flower. Um, they're fast flyers, um, most are active at night, but some are crepuscular and then others are, are daytime. Um, Aaron put this link down here, which I didn't make a live link, but um, to show that the other group of really large moths that, that um, we have in our area are the silk moths, so luna moths and prometheus moths and cecropia moths, uh, also rosy maple moths. Those are in, and buck moths are, are, in, um, are in the silk moth family. And there is a, a, a citizen science project that's helping document locations of those. Uh, you can also put them on our naturalist project and Janet Myhook, the coordinator of that project can get, get that information off of a naturalist. Some more examples of sphinx moths. Um, that's a Pandora sphinx. It's it's highly mobile, um, and I think they they might not even breed in New York, but they they show up at, often on Long Island, um, and some other day flyers uh, as well. Um, my dream is to become a, a nighttime moth photographer, but I, um, I might have to keep my day job in the meantime. This is an example of um, uh, another um, insect that. Um, it's seen to be a pest. So this is a tomato hornworm, as those of you who grow tomatoes might recognize. <laughs> There's also a tobacco horn hornworm, and they do incredible damage to the leaves of, of tomato plants and, um, and tobacco plants, respectively. But when they grow up, when they become adults, they are sphinx moths that are pollinators. So um, think about that before um, you just casually toss your tomato hornworm plants uh, or to tomato hornworms, <laughs> excuse me, into the trash, uh, keep in mind that if you can find a way for them, them to keep off of your tomato plants and get on your neighbor's tomato plants, then they can still provide the pollination services as adults. Within the outlet moths, um, this is the largest family of moths in Noctuity. We're focusing on one little group, and by focusing on, we mean we're just documenting all the photographs we can and, and museum records of this family. Um, and there are many, many subfamilies within this, but here's the primrose, um, primrose flower moth, beautiful little, I mean, these, are, these guys are pretty tiny. They're maybe a centimeter to mix metric in English. They're maybe a, a centimeter long. And that's the Argisera flower moth, also strikingly colored uh, or patterned anyway. Um, and, uh, and you might see them about, I don't see them very often, to be honest. Okay, that's the end of the focal taxa part of the project, of the description. And, um, and I'm summarizing it by, um, by highlighting some books that everyone should have. And um, the, best, um, the best guide that I've found to um, the variety of bees that, that, um, that are out there in our world is this one, the bees in your backyard. There's this Bumblegate Bee Guide to North America, which is really detailed and shows endless patterns that some of these species have been shown to, to um, uh, to exhibit. So it, it might, if you're um, a newbie, it might confuse you more than it enlightens you. Um, but as you get more and more expert, it will become an invaluable resource. Uh, there's a natural history of hoverflies book that the Europeans are way ahead as they are on, on many, um, many um, scientific and, and natural history endeavors, uh, way ahead of, of us on, on this. But um, they've understood um, how cool hoverflies are for a long time. But we're living in an exciting time because the Field Guide to the Flower Flies of Northeastern North America just came out last year. It's, it's only $22, $25, something like that. And it's, um, I've covered a part of the title, but it's a beautiful book um, and really helpful. And we hope does what for, um, for hoverflies, what, uh, what the uh, dragonfly and damselfly guides did um, for them starting in the 1990s and really made them a source of popular attention. More books. For beetles, I love this big book called Beetles of Eastern North America. It's not uh, complete, of course, because to be complete, it would need to be um, 
20 volumes of that or 60 volumes of that. Um, but it's got really nice pictures of a lot of the most common species. Uh, I do wish it would say when there are things you could confuse it with that are not shown in the book, um, because there are some lookalikes that, that it doesn't mention, but it does a great job of helping you narrow down what you're looking at. There's a field guide to the Northeastern Longhorn Beetles um, that if you can find it, it's, uh, it's definitely worthwhile if you're interested in that group. It shows pinned insects and not the best lighting, so the photographs aren't fantastic, but it is the best single resource to longhorn beetles, uh, and including the ones that we're, we're focused on. For moths and butterflies, um, I do have some, I think, example of a butterfly guide here. I don't own it myself, but I've heard good things about it. And there's these North Woods guides. If you are in the Adirondacks or in northern parts of the state, uh, they're just nice little books of, again, most of the most common species. The Peterson Guide um, to Moths that came out about six to eight years ago, uh, I love. I think moth experts have found some, some errors, but not, um, not enough to make it not useful. And again, help you narrow things down. I want to point out that Seabrook Leckie, the second author of this, was uh, my field assistant in 2003 for my dissertation on birds. And I apparently chased her away from birds, and she became a moth expert. And this caterpillar book for moths and bullet butterflies is fantastic. If you don't have this, this David Wagner, he's a Yukon uh, insect genius, and he's, um, he's got a beautiful book on, on the caterpillar ID. I almost never don't find what I'm looking for in that book, which I can't say of a lot of field guides. Finally, um, I would be remiss in, in not highlighting the work of some of our partners. So Brian Danforth, who I've mentioned, excuse me, um, just released a book on the solitary bees. And, and so, as I mentioned, about two thirds of our Bees are solitary, and it's a whole volume on natural history and conservation and uh, biology of, of solitary bees. Um, Sam Drogi and, and a colleague um, compiled a lot of their very now famous photographs of bees, these stacked images that are in, you know, with a ba black background that really highlights key features of these bees and makes them look so uh, beautiful to the average person, I think, that um, they, they compiled that into a book. They don't gain any royalties from it because it's federal government. So um, if you want to contribute a little bit to the general treasury, you can buy that. It's a beautiful book and I highly recommend it. Lots of online resources, of course. Um, Bug Guide is, is a great source for um, scrolling through photos that people have identified or submitting your own photos. I use, I, we use iNaturalist for that in our project and, and we prefer you do that. Um, we can get some information from Bug Guide, but it's not set up like iNat is for uh, specific location information, and um, and it, it's it's sort of needed and updated. the com the pro the process is a little cumbersome for um, for getting things identified, and um, but it it's got tons of photos and tons of experts that have used it and and identified insects that way. A couple other LEP um, sites, Discover Life has now online keys to a lot of bees, and that Sam Jerky has has built with colleagues, um, and so and their online keys that don't require you to go pair by pair. They're not dichotomous keys. They're not, is it this feature or that feature? But it, you narrow down the keys called a random access key. And you narrow down your species by um, saying, OK, it's, it's yellow, and it's large, and it's got, uh, it's got no black on the head, or it has black on the head. And so you select all the characters you, can, you know something about, and that helps you narrow down uh, what the possibilities are. And then you can get more detail on each of those. iNaturalist is a great, now a great source for identification, and I'm going to demo that uh, in a little bit. And then our own website um, is a natural history website. It's not really, it has some ID tips, uh, but we provide conservation guides for a lot of our tracked species. Not so much for these species yet, because we're still learning about them ourselves and, and still understanding their, their status in New York. But we have a couple of flies on there. We've got many, most of the bumblebees, the rare bumblebees now written. So it's mostly rare species, or almost all rare species, and, and also natural community types. So uh, please do check that out if you can. Uh, a couple of specific ones. Here's the, the bees of Eastern New York, uh, excuse me, Eastern United States uh, is a classic, um, Mitchell 1962, and it's online now. So, um, so that's really helpful. Um, then there's a, a paper on the bee flies of Ontario, and luckily these are publicly available. I just checked yesterday, so these links should work. Um, the PDF I sent yesterday had some of these links 
I think these links were working. Some of the other links were not. And so I fixed those and I have a new PDF if anyone needs that. But um, these links I think were working yesterday and they're um, bee flies of Ontario and then um, surfids of Ontario um, to, to get to genus. So not Ontario, New Arctic, the New Arctic region, which includes Ontario. So great, great resources there too. Now I'd like to go into survey methodology, but I think I'll stop for a second and ask for questions and then we'll take another break during the methodology portion. It doesn't look like anyone has any questions, Matt. I answered everything. Yeah. Anything anyone Zero. could ever want to know. No, everyone's. Well, I hope um, and Aaron, Aaron has just joined, Matt. Oh, good. Hi, Aaron. <laughs> I, met, I introduced Aaron before as uh, uh, my co-conspirator on this project, and um, and uh, maybe we'll call on her for for uh, a couple of questions later. Um, there was one question. Is um, Evelyn had a question on the, the bee host plant list that you referenced. Yeah, just after the break, I, I shared a website that, um, okay. yeah, I think you had stepped away, but I shared a website that um, jaredfowler.com and he's a musician, I think, but also a bee enthusiast. And he and Sam Drogi put together this great website of, of specialist bees. And, uh, and so um, I pointed everyone to that. Okay, perfect. Yeah. But I think that was the only, <clears throat> only question okay well if they come up again please um, I don't know how we're doing on time I feel like I might be a little long-winded and might be running late but we'll see how that goes we can always the videos I have to show you are uh, um, are ones that we could you could watch in your own time too and so we might decide to trim there a little bit but um but we'll, we'll get started on survey methods and and then see how we're doing on time in a little bit if you are um, interested in participating in the project and, and um, um, want suggestions for where to survey, you know, these are our general suggestions. What we do in our statewide efforts, as I mentioned, we have surveys with uh, trained biologists, um, our own staff and, and, and the field crew we hire. Um, in what we call our extensive survey, that means we're sort of spread all over the state in, in uh, semi-randomized fashion. Um, we are aiming for uh, a meadow, a wetland, a, a forest, and a roadside in every sample point. So we get to a point and we find one of those habitats to sample in and we do these four bowl transects accompanied by netting. And I'll talk about those protocols in a little bit. So that's our extensive survey. And if you wanna mimic that, that's, that's the way to make the data sort of the most useful for us. We also have target habitat types, special uh, habitat types where we thought we, would, we wouldn't represent them well enough in the statewide extensive effort. And so, uh, but we thought that they would have rare or interesting um, pollinator biodiversity. So that includes pine barrens, it includes uh, alpine, and peatlands, dunes, and then the um, late successional forests I mentioned for specifically for um, surfeits, flies. Of course, you're looking for flowering plants and particularly natural habitats. Uh, native species as much as possible, although you will find a lot of pollinators in the generalists, especially using non-natives. Um, you could consider going to um, a few sites repeatedly. One thing we're not doing in our study because it's, it's statewide and it's extensive is that we're not understanding the pollinator fauna of a particular place very well. It's a snapshot. We go to one place on one day and then we sample there and then we move on. And, and so if you really want to understand the pollinator fauna of say a park or, um, or your backyard, you would want to sample multiple times per year and really understand the fauna of, of that place. Um, just if, of course, if you're surveying private property, please make sure to, um, to get landowner permission. And then there's an urban version of this that I presented to a New York City pollinator group um, that, um, that there are, I think, a lot of interesting urban habitats that, that will support pollinators and might have some interesting species uh, that you wouldn't find elsewhere. And so um, included in that are green roofs, uh, botanical gardens, parks, uh, city parks, and, uh, and then street medians too, and, and street trees. Um, they, they, um, they are the best habitats in, in many big cities like New York City uh, for, for finding interesting pollinators. When? Um, 
our, we consider our field season from about now, although at least upstate, the weather's not really cooperative for it. And that makes me happy because I don't feel the pressure to be outside at a time when it's quite difficult to, to get outside. But um, in theory, our, our season could start in mid-April and could go till mid-October. The bulk of the field work for us is, is May through um, September. Um, we try to um, concentrate our sampling in, in the, the peak of the, the heat of the day, um, which is roughly 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. So when we put out our bee bowls, for instance, that's the, the time we aim for because we can't have them out. We, we have them out just for a single day. Um, and we're aiming for warm, dry, sunny days of at least 65 degrees. I did mention there could be, um, there could be insects active at, at, in cooler temperatures and on cloudier days, but because um, uh, we have a little bit of luxury and not wanting to be in the, not needing to be in the field for this project every single day, we do try to, uh, to pick the best days to do our pollinator surveys. So our primary methods for focal taxa are, are netting and bee bowls. And I'm gonna talk about each of those in detail and then and we'll look at some videos. Hey Matt, I'm sorry. Yeah. Can you discuss wind? Yeah, good, good idea. Um, so windy days aren't great and, and they're especially not great for photography. So um, what I've found is that um, it's hard enough to get a bug to stand still on a plant that won't stand still on a relatively calm day. And so when you have wind in the mix, um, uh, it's extremely hard to, to, to take a good photograph. I also think that wind will suppress insect activity. Um, and so if it's, if it's really windy and I don't, have a, I don't have a particular guideline, but if the breeze is strong, you know, if you're seeing, um, if you're seeing the branches of trees moving, then, then I think it's not a great day to survey. Sometimes that's all you get and that's understandable, you know, and, and we can make use of information even on bad weather days. We just might sort of analyze the data a little differently from days that we can sort of look at and say, oh God, that was a terrible day to be out. Uh, we have three bugs, but maybe those three bugs are interesting bugs, you don't know. So I, I would never say it's never worth it, but in, in to the degree to which you can um, avoid windy days, just like rainy and, and and cloudier days, the better. Um, hand netting, uh, sometimes just called netting. Uh, it's the use of an aerial insect to catch insects, of course. And um, did, did I say an aerial insect? An aer aerial insect net <laughs> to catch insects. Uh, what you're seeing here is just the head of a net. It will, um, there will be a pole um, in this kind of net. There's a pole that attaches here that can, that can be, you know, just another three feet. It could be, um, or, or two feet, I mean, or, um, or it could be another four feet on top of this, and there's some that are even longer than that. Um, the handbook, I'm always gonna refer you back to the handbook as a place to look uh, for, for more detail. Um, we're not practicing this in the field today. We're practicing this in the field. I don't know, I thought I edited that. Um, <laughs> we're practicing by looking at videos and talking about it. And, uh, and then I just encourage you to practice um, on your own at an appropriate distance from your field partner. We recommend a timed search. Um, so um, when we do this as part of our extensive survey, uh, we, we try to do, uh, I think I mentioned four bull transects, and I'll talk about what those transects are in a minute, but um, at each of those transects then, we follow up with half an hour. We have a two-person crew and we go for half an hour uh, and, and net at each, along and around each of those transects. And, um, and the half hour helps to standardize uh, uh, the sampling. Because what we're doing in, in our netting protocol is not random sweep netting, like probably many of you who have sampled insects before might do a more standardized method is, is to randomly sweep net vegetation, you know, three sweeps across, you know, through these plants, these shrubs, and then what you get, you get. We are targeting particular insects when we net. We're saying, I'm gonna go catch that bug right there. And that's meant to complement the bull trapping, which is more of a passive um, survey methodology. So we standardize to some degree by, by saying we're going to net for half an hour. We also are not, you know, not saying, oh, half, oh there's this perfect rare species over there. Um, I'm not going to get it because I'm at 30 minutes exactly. Well, you know, we don't have to be quite that precise about it. Um, the goal is to, is to come up with a rough standardization for, for the uh, amount of time you spend. We can also get incidental observations this way. And so, um, so when we're out in the field for other reasons, as I mentioned, we're, you know, we're, we're out in the field looking for 
uh, rare species of all kinds. But if we happen upon an interesting place for pollinators or happen to see an interesting species, we might catch it and, and, um, and, and use it as part of the project. It just would be analyzed, those data would be analyzed, those incidental observations, those random captures would be analyzed in a different way from how we analyze our statewide extensive sampling data. Bowl trapping then is, um, we're using these small bowls filled with soapy water to catch and collect pollinators. Sam Drogi will demonstrate for that for us in a minute. Um, we're timing deployment during the warmest part of the day. Again, we aim for 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. That can be shifted a bit depending on your travel time and um, ideally it's at least five hours in the warm part of the day. Some days that can be in the heat of the summer, that could be 12 to five and, and you'd still you know, be well within the warmest part of the day. We set 15 bowls. We have yellow bowls, white bowls, and blue bowls. Sam will talk about that. And we alternate those. We put them three meters apart. Sam will say five, but um, it's understood that there's some variability there. And then we're filling them with soapy water, about three quarters full. And so that soapy water, that soap, breaks the surface tension and insects that come are, are trapped and drown. And they drown quickly. I kept this in here for nocturnal surveys because if you're interested in moths, especially um, nocturnal moths, um, this is a great way to sample them. It's not part of our statewide study, um, but, um, but it's a great way to get to know your moth fauna. And, uh, and the way people typically do this is a, a black light. Um, there's a black light attached to a sheet and the sheet gives the moths a place to rest. Um, diverse native vegetation is gonna give you the biggest diversity of moths. Humid and moonless nights are best, warm, warm nights. Um, if you are interested in lethal moth collection, you can use a, a trap like this. Uh, here's, the, here's the black light. Um, you can use mercury vapor lights too, which are even a, have a wider range of, of wavelengths that attract um, nocturnal insects. And, uh, and insects come to the funnel um, or to the, uh, they're kind of brought in toward the, the, the light and then funneled down into a bucket that has a collecting agent in it, usually ethyl acetate, um, which then kills them and then they're available for collection. And this is a battery in the cooler uh, because you can need a, a, a motorcycle battery or, or even a car battery to run those trap, um, those lights all night long. I mentioned a malaise trap earlier and that's an example of a malaise trap and it is a way to People catch moths and you catch a whole variety of other things too. So I don't recommend this for the average enthusiast unless you have a lot of time to pan and identify insects. Um, you'll, you'll collect far more than, than you might actually otherwise be able to, to um, process and identify. And then um, iNaturalist, we're gonna talk about in more detail. Um, I'm just highlighting here that um, it's it's not the only fun and easy way to contribute data, but to me, it's sort of the most fun way. Um, you don't need to know anything about the species you're collecting. You take a picture, you upload it to iNaturalist, and somebody, some nerd on the internet is gonna identify it for you. Sometimes that nerd is, is one of us. Sometimes that nerd is somebody in Hong Kong, and, uh, and the community of iNaturalist experts is, um, is really great. Sometimes you'll get you know, an identification in a day. Sometimes you need to prompt specific people or um, but we're getting a lot of really wonderful data that way. And it's really important to understand how your camera works um, when you do this. And I'll, I'll demonstrate that in a little bit. Okay, so now I actually think we are on schedule pretty well. Um, I'd like to do videos by, um, a couple of videos by Sam Drogi and then leave a little time for discussion. This is the most experimental part of this morning. I've given versions of that other two hours of presenting before. Um, this is the part where I, I ask for your um, uh, understanding that um, we're trying this out and we're gonna see if it works. And so Sam will talk for, I think our first, we'll do two videos on netting. They'll last about 10 or 12 minutes. And then, um, and then we'll talk about it and, and you can ask questions. Um, and then we'll do the same for bowl trapping. And then later we'll take, we'll take a break, do iNaturalist training. Um, and then we'll come back to videos to talk about um, processing specimens and, and pinning them. So um, I've made a playlist. So Sam has a number of videos on his YouTube page. Some of them have nothing to do with insect collection, but, um, but I've made a playlist and that's the link here. We can try it within the PowerPoint and see if it opens up. Um, and then, um, so now I'm gonna share, imagine you're still seeing, seeing my PowerPoint. So now, you should be seeing YouTube. 
And this is the playlist I made, which just means you tag some of his existing videos and say, put these in a playlist. Um, and I've shared this with you. And so it's, it's public. All his videos are public um, anyway. And I just collected the ones I thought would be most relevant to our training and, and put them here. So um, I think we'll start by watching Sam's two um, videos as long as I'm just gonna assume unless I hear otherwise that you're seeing YouTube and, uh, and we'll surveys and are collecting these now Oops. Um, and they haven't necessarily um, been trained by anyone or even gone out with anyone else so we want to give them some perspective on how we catch these footprints and uh, so this little video is the result um, we are doing this with very inexpensive equipment and completely have no idea what we're doing but we're going to give it a shot and we'll see what happens okay let me start the video now go okay so here's the basic situation there's a flower it has bees on it you have a neck you're standing by it what you're going to want to do is center your swing on the head of that flower and the trick here is that you're going to want to do it fast because bees are fast and if you approach it slowly or try and be concerned about the uh, flower being preserved or not you're going to miss those bees so it's fast you often clip off the head of the flower that's just kind of the way it is. If you don't do that, you're going to miss many bees. Okay, so after you catch a bee, you can flip the tip of the net over, and then you snap the bees down to the bottom. And then at that point, you can grab the net below, and the bees can't escape. You can walk around with the net flipped over like that. Okay, here we are out in the field again, and um, I haven't got anything in the net, and I'm pulling the tip of the net against the handle getting ready to start. There's some more goldenrod, bees and wasps, all kinds of good things on there. As I'm collecting, I'm snapping the cats down to the bottom, and that means I can grab above the top of the bees and wasps, and they're not going to get out, and they're also not going to sting me like that. So at that point, I can keep collecting, I can keep snapping, I can keep putting things down at the bottom. I can accumulate a lot of bees into that net as I'm collecting. So I continue to snap things to the bottom. I grab them. I look before I grab it just in case there's a big Callistes wasp in there which tends to cling to the sides. But I, there's no reason for me to have to clean out my net and to put things into the um, killing pile um, after just catching one bee. It's much, much faster to keep collecting and to um, accumulate a large number of bees and wasps in your net before taking them out. So we're continuing to do that. Um, I can pick out the uh, grass and I can put the heads of the uh, flowers in there after I snap them down. The bees don't usually escape that quickly. Um, let's see what else. Stinging usually isn't a problem. I'm going to be putting my net hand into the net later and a, uh, the uh, bees are not that interested in stinging me. And in fact, they can be crawling all over your hands. I'm careful about the social wasps and bees because they tend to sting without with less provocation and of course they're bigger and it hurts whereas the little ones even if they could sting don't really end up hurting you okay this last segment here it shows how to catch bees that are flying over and near the ground either on a nest site or their nest parasites looking for nests you really can't swing at them very effectively because they're so close to the ground you just your neck drags on the ground and you have very little surface area in which to catch the bees um, so what we're going to do is slap uh, the whole net head onto the ground very quickly, and again, very fast, slap it down, and I walk over and I pull up the uh, tip of the net, and the natural inclination of the bees, of course, is to crawl upwards. So, and it actually takes quite a while, so you're going to sit there, you know, look for the bee or wasp, crawl up, and I pick it up very quickly, pull it back, and snap everything to the bottom, and then I look and see whether I've got it there or not. Now, <clears throat> in terms of taking bees out of um, uh, the net. So I've got a load of bees in there. I take my vial, which is really just a centrifuge tube filled with alcohol or scoopy water. I'm going to insert the uh, tube with the cap in my hand already into the net. And I'm going to carefully just let a few of those bees out at a time. The big social ones usually come first. I can grab them off the edge of the net, um, holding the tube against the netting. Um, often they need a little bit of encouragement, so you see me tapping the tip of the net down. 
down. I'm just really popping them into the uh, water. Once they go in, they don't come back out, which is very different from, say, a uh, kill jar with ethyl acetate or cyanide in it. Um, that's the nice thing about collecting directly into alcohol. Um, you can use our uh, processing things later to um, get them back into good shape. Once you process them well, they're not going to. So I can keep doing this, and I can have a large number of bees and wasps in there. And my final procedure usually is to scrape the little ones off the sides, and then I hold the net up. Bees crawl over the top. You see them. I can pull the netting over to the side, and by scraping the well, that's pretty much it. I guess if there's questions, you can email or this is very useful. Thank you very much. All right, we're going to watch one more of those. And I think this is it. Yeah. Hi, today we want to do a very short video on how to catch bees with a net. This is the detail. So what we found is that when we've been training people on how to catch bees with nets, that a lot of times people are taking very big swings, bees are being missed. We want to show people the fine scale of catching a bee. So you have a net. What you want to do, and I'm left-handed, so you may have to change this to right-handed uh, behavior, but you want to have in your right hand the net tip against the pole, and the action is always going to be a snap rather than a sweep. So you want to push down with your left hand and pull up with your right at the same time, and that leverage is going to give you the speed to catch the bee. The other thing that you don't want to be doing is you don't want to have a large sweeping motion because once the net starts moving quickly, the bee or other insects are going to pick that up almost right away and will start its escape move. You want to be within a few feet or, a, you know, better, about a foot away from that bee before you snap it so that it has very little chance of escaping. You're almost guaranteed to have it in your net. So when you're approaching a flower, like we're going to approach some flowers over here, you're going to move relatively slowly and then you're going to move your net like this. So if there's a bee on that, but there's not right now. You're going to move up to about a foot away from the flower. And then when the bee is in position, actually I see bee. When the bee is in position, you're going to snap very quickly to catch that bee. You're not sweeping from far away because it'll scare it off. So here we go. I'm going to push down with my left hand, pull up with my right. It'll be very quick motion. And I'm going to flick the net down to move that specimen into the bottom. And That's the basics for the thing. You want to get close and you want to make the motion more like a snake than swinging a baseball bat. Swinging a baseball bat, you're going to scare the bee off before it even gets close to the net. And what also will happen is that uh, the net has a, quite a bit of resistance, air resistance. So you're not going to actually be able to move it as fast as you think you can. Okay, another thing of that I wanted to demonstrate but didn't in that last cut was that when you're approaching the flower, you don't want to approach like this, face onward. You want to turn to the side because otherwise, if you're like this, you can't move the net quickly. So you have to turn to the side so that when you push down and pull up, either down or up, it will um, have uh, you know, free motion here. So here's the same thing. You move up to plant, move the net fairly slowly, and at the last minute, flip it upside down. You note that I dropped the tip of the net from the net handle as I was starting the motion. You don't want to let the tip drag because it's going to pick up brambles and uh, it'll flip over all those kinds of things. You want it like this. Okay, the second technique is basically the same, but if you have, I'm going to let this be go, um, is uh, if you have a shorter flower um, and you can't uh, really use this technique because it's too close to the ground. And remember, if it's close to the ground, your net is only going to have a small window in which to intersect with that flower. And um, so in this particular case, you're going to want to put the net over the top of the flower to capture the bee. But it's the same process. You move up close, and when you're about a foot or a foot and a half away, what you're going to do is slap the net over the top. But it's the opposite motion. So your right hand is going to push down, and your left hand is going to pull up. So it's that two-part uh, movement that gives you speed. So it's not like, again, swinging a bat. It's very, very fast. And what you want to do is hit it 
and this is actually a poor net to demonstrate this was because it doesn't have a flexible rim, but the cheaper, more flexible nets are actually even better, is I'm going to now very quickly push down with the right, pull up with the left to have a very fast capture action. So here we go. So once it's down over the plant, you can lift it up and the bees will rise to the top. And at some point when the bees are about halfway up the net, you can pull the net out and flick that bead at the bottom and catch it. So those are the basics. And um, I hope that was useful. All right, we'll let them get their credits. I'm going to pause before we start the next one. I said I'm going to pause before we start the next one. <laughs> Okay. All right. Um, any questions about netting technique? I, I have actually some, um, maybe a couple of points first, and then and then questions. Um, the the technique that that Sam demonstrates of of shaking the bees, snapping the bees down to the the um, the bottom of the net and carrying around a whole net load um, is is a really great idea. And uh, it is something I personally have never mastered. I think um, many of us um, who have not worked with bees for a long time uh, either don't feel comfortable holding a bag of bees and walking around with it or are concerned that they'll escape. And then getting them out of the net is also, um, uh, you know, a little bit more daunting when you've got, you know, 30 in there or 100 in there as opposed to, you know, a couple. Um, so it's less efficient. Um, to, to collect the bees into your collecting vial uh, after each catch, by far uh, less efficient, but it is the way that many of us end up doing it. The other note is on the, the collecting uh, vial itself. Um, we use um, little um, uh, vials, like kind of, um, oh, I forget if they have a name, but he had a what's called a falcon tube. It's a centrifuge tube and he um, collects directly, Sam, collects, di collects directly into alcohol or soapy water and then uh, processes all his bees the same way using, you know, washing and drying and, and, um, uh, and, then, and then pinning. Um, we prefer uh, to collect into a cyanide vial. So um, we, have, um, a, we have a cyanide source um, <laughs> that uh, you have to be careful how you email this information around to people and, and careful what words you use in your email, maybe come up with a code of some sort. Um, but um, we do use cyanide that, that we get from Cornell and, and, um, and we have vials that are charged with cyanide and they last a couple of years, which is really nice. Um, there is that danger once you've gotten a bee in it or any other insect in it, it's trying to get out for a little bit until the cyanide overwhelms it. Um, it is a pretty quick death and that's, um, that can be true of ethyl acetate too. Ethyl acetate has the, uh, the drawback of um, most collection vials are wider mouthed and, and so you can't open and close a vial like a jar like that um, and expect insects that are, are still alive in there to get out. And I think ethyl acetate takes a little longer and also um, it, it has a pretty powerful smell and some people are quite sensitive to it. And, um, and you wanna make sure you have really good ventilation if you're using ethyl acetate, but it can work. Um, so there are a lot of ways um, to, to kill bees um, and, and other insects if you're, um, if you're collecting. Um, I'm just telling you about the, the ways that we use. So now I'll stop for questions. Uh, Matt, it doesn't look like there's any questions pertaining to the uh, sampling. Um, there's one question that Sue has regarding um, honeybee populations, um, but I think we'll address that after you're done with the survey. Okay, sounds good. And uh, Aaron chimed in to remind me um, on, on the chat privately that um, uh, pill, pill bottle vials are, are great too for, um, you can collect if you're, if you're willing again to, if you have a lot of them and um, you can collect insects from nets into pill vials um, without a killing agent. Uh, you would just need to do that for each insect um, because um, 
because they can escape if you open it back up again, if you don't have a killing agent inside. So you can use a, a, a pill vial, pill bottle vial, or a, uh, we used to use film canisters when film, photographic film existed. We used to use film canisters. Um, and, uh, and, and those are great too, if you're just doing a little bit of collecting. Uh, and then you can freeze them. So you go straight into the freezer from there. And that's true of any insects that you pan. If you, if you dispatch them with, um, with uh, cyanide or ethyl acetate too, they need to go in the freezer until they're, unless you're pinning them right, right then that day. Um, you'll need to freeze them until you're, you're ready to pin. So two questions came in that are related um, from Jean and Phyllis regarding um, Jean wanted to know what sized area should we be using and Phyllis wanted to know if there's a certain plot size preferred for field sampling um, relating to, I think there's some confusion on the transects. Yeah, sure. Uh, good, great questions. Um, <clears throat> so in our, in our extensive survey protocol, we are not, um, uh, we don't have a defined plot size. We decided instead to limit our sampling by time. Uh, you could do both. And depending on, you know, your own personal interests and, um, and the needs of any projects or, or that you're working on or, or, um, any, or your particular organization, you might decide that you're just interested in, in a standardized area. Uh, you might find within a standardized area that there's nothing really flowering that's, that's of interest. You might find that it's, if you randomize a plot, that it, it has all the same species of plant and, and therefore not a great diversity of pollinators. So we've given our technicians and ourselves the freedom to explore where we think are, are the best um, are the best places to, uh, to, to look for pollinators and the greatest diversity of plants and greatest diversity of pollinators that they can find. Uh, within a half an hour, and and that's the way we limit it. Then, so rather than rather than saying you must stay within 20 feet of a transect or something like that, we say start around the transect, and then and then you are free to wander to wherever you think the the um, the best place to sample is. Um, that might not work for for any other you know protocols or projects, but if um but if you're following our protocol, that that's what we would we would ask you to do. I, I, Hope that helps. I mean, the transects themselves are are just lines, and then and then we try to get a, a netting, you know, time search done in and around that transect, um, but we're not specific to the area. And and I, I saw another question on the chat, um, asking whether the piano music is part of it. And he is. It is. Yeah, I think Sam plays that himself, and for some reason feels like it needs a <laughs> musical background. Um, I know his voice is a little hard to hear at times because it's in. He's often in the field, and um, uh, but I hope you're hearing it okay. But um, the music is lovely. I, it's, it's just uh, uh, it's um, it is part of it. Other questions for now, or should we look at the bee bowl? Sam, I don't see any additional ones popping up at this point. All right, all right. Let's let's go into bee bowls, and um, Sam will demo that in um, in two, again two videos. And, um, and then we'll take a break from watching videos and, and, um, and do the iNaturalist demo. Researchers use bowls or hand traps or bowl traps or bowls to catch bees. And the basic idea is that bees are attracted to different colors. Oops, sorry. We painted bowls in different colors here. We use three colors, blue, a fluorescent blue actually, and a fluorescent yellow and white. And the bowls are set outside, uh, a little bit of water with soap is added to those bowls. The soap gets rid of the surface tension. Hey Matt, I think we've lost the sound. Into those bowls. Also, <laughs> all right. Sorry about that. Turns out if I mute, I then uh, then it mutes the video. So I guess you're you must be hearing it through my computer speakers. I'm not sure exactly. I was gonna mute for a second and and, and duck out, but um, I won't mute, and I'll go back uh, about you know, 20 seconds here and uh, and start over with sound. Sorry about that. Told you it was an experiment. Once again, the water for their nests and things. And the 
gas can sit on the surface tension, but the silt gets rid of the surface tension, and bees are going to slide into those bowls and be captured, basically. The silt also um, uh, ends up uh, killing the bees quickly, so within a, about a minute, the bees have stopped moving. So it's a very effective way to sample bees, and it's used quite extensively. It doesn't get all the different species in general, but it gets probably somewhere on the order of 70 to 80 percent of the fauna in an area. And it's something that can be done by um, pretty much anyone in just a few minutes of training and you know how to put up bowls. We'll be going outside in a second and we'll show you how to do those bowls. But just want to point out one other thing, which is that studies have shown, or studies in the east, uh, eastern North America have shown that the size of the bowl really doesn't matter. Um, so we've used bowls that are this small and compare them to um, bowls that you can buy in the uh, grocery store and a party store of different colors, and the uh, number of these countries is absolutely the same. Um, no statistical difference at all. Um, the thing that does make a difference is color. So you need all three colors because different species of bees are attracted to those different colors. Um, we've tried other colors um, to about the same effect as those three. So we standardize on those three. We've also now developed our own paint. We use a base paint and we add a fluorescent pigment to it that we purchased, and we have that in our bee manual. You can um, look that up online. And the reason for that is that it gives us a standardized way of talking about color. I can give you an example of those colors um, or the formula, and then in 100 years, someone can replicate them. So, without that, we're not quite sure what's in uh, this great paint. So obviously it's it's not the summer coming, it's winter here. We're doing this for demonstration purposes, so you have to ignore the fact that there's no bees on the trees. But if it was a good time of year, what we'd be doing is putting on a set of bowls, and I'm using this size here. And the nice thing about this size of bowl is that I can hold a whole set of bowls in one hand, and as I'm walking along, I can pull out the next bowl and pour water. As I come to the place that I want to put a bowl, I can set it down on the ground. I can keep going, and my speed at putting on bowls is, is, uh, is fixed. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to fill the bowl about three quarters to full. It doesn't really matter. We've done tests to show that anywhere between half and completely full, it matches about the same number of bees. So I'm going to walk five meters, and I pace up what the five meters is. So I don't have to do have to measurements to make sure it's five meters. It needs to be roughly five meters. And I'm going to pour as I go. So I've got my jug, and I like this particular style of jug with a nice handle. It's easy to pour. And I might be doing several hundred of uh, bowls a day, so I want to make sure it's efficient. So having actually a nice jug of thick plastic is useful. And I've already added soap to the jug, and what I've got in here is a gallon of water. I just use tap water if I'm just drinking off stream water. I put just a big squirt of detergent in. You don't have to measure. It turns out also the amount of detergent really doesn't affect the rate at which bees end up in bowls or climb out. So a big squirt of detergent. Make sure it's a non-citrus or non-citrus scented detergent because it turns out that the citrus citrus scent um, is something that repels rather than attracts bees. So you want something like um, the regular bee dishwashing liquid or lab soap. You can use a variety of soap, you can use laundry soap. They all seem to work about the same. We've done tests to show that. The only thing that's negative is if there's a citrus base to the detergent uh, itself. So I'm going to go ahead and put out a series of bowls and then we'll show you how to do the captures. So as I go along, I take my bowl and I pull out the next one and I fill it up. And as I put it down, I'm adding water to it. And I
Okay, so we've finished putting out the balls. We left them out for a whole day or maybe more than a day. And we put them out early in the morning and put them up late in the evening. And now we're ready to take whatever our catch is out of the bowls. So what I use is a little uh, net here. This one's a brine shrimp net. It's got a very fine mesh to it. Um, a lot of people will use sips. Some may get at the uh, or tea strainers. It doesn't really matter. I just have to prefer this thing. They're inexpensive. I don't like them. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pick up the bowls and I'm going to dump each bowl of contents into the net as I go along. And I'm not going to try and separate them by bowl or by color. That's uh, uh, not the usual goal for traps. Uh, it's not efficient to dump it into the uh, net. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. Uh, just so you know, it takes as uh, as it does to put out bowls. So we've picked up all the bees out of the bowls. You can see how I hold the net and the bowls in one hand. I get frees up my other hand to pick up bowls or do other things. And now we've got the specimens in the bowls and I need to take them out and put them into something. I, we use whirl packs and we'll show that in a second. Um, what you can also use is just a Ziploc baggie. Um, it just needs to be something that can hold alcohol and keep the specimens separate. Some people use vials. Um, but the problem with vials is that they are cumbersome, take up a lot of room, and um, can break. So when I have them in the net, um, what I found is just a simple plastic spoon. It doesn't have to be plastic. Um, you can come in and scoop the uh, specimens out. I'm not doing a good job here because I'm trying to do two things at once. And then you have the specimens on the spoon. You might have to do it a couple times. And then you can take them and dump them into the bag or into the uh, bowl. Okay, so <clears throat> we've gone out, collected our bees, we've got them in a spoon. What we're going to do is add them to a whirl pack so that we can uh, store them until we have time to process them. So we just uh, drop the bees in, click them off, we add a site label. So what that information here has is the site number and then the date. And note that date is always set so that the month is spelled out or use Roman numerals and the um, year and the day of the month is done in, um, in, our, in regular numbers. That way we don't get confused as to what the month is and what the day is. You add that in, it's always done in pencil. Um, even technical pens sometimes run, so you want to put it the, the label in pencil. You add it to the world pack. Let's get this right. Add it in there. And then when I'm in the field, I then just fold this over one time and uh, do a quick twist. And then I add the alcohol later when I'm back in the lab because it just takes too much time and it's too much of a bother to take alcohol in the field. And then when I'm back in the lab, what I do is I open this back up and I add alcohol. And what I'm going to do is I'm not going to add alcohol um, a lot of alcohol. I'm just going to add enough alcohol that it covers the specimens. Um, you don't really need to be in, in a, a great deal of alcohol. You can see that the alcohol is just to that level there. And then what I do is all the air of the bag. Note that there's a place to write here. Um, usually doesn't work well. If you write on there, it smears, it comes off the ink runs. So that's why we always put the site label in there. So we take the air out, and then I roll the top down, and I keep going until, and I can roll the label right up to, until I get to the level of the water. And then I twist the ties together, like that. 
And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to tuck that end in because it's made of wire. I can poke another bag. And then I can take this and I can put it in a another Ziploc bag with all the um, the other world packs that were collected that particular day. And then I'm pretty much done. Um, if I'm going to process it very quickly, I'll just leave it out. If it's going to be a while, I'll put it in the refrigerator or a freezer. Okay, I'm going to um, talk over the credits here and and uh, and just mention a couple things that we do or have been doing a little bit differently from from the way Sam uh, demonstrated. One is that um, uh, how you get the insects out of the bowls and how you deploy the bowls is is very much a personal preference and and uh, depending on available personnel. So. Because we have a crew of two, we actually use both people to put the bowls out. We'll have somebody placing the bowls and the other person following behind and filling them. Um, uh, that seems to work a little more smoothly than this sort of um, this one-handed method that, that um, I'm going to pause here. Nope, not there yet. Now pause. Okay. Um, actually, I'm going to jump out of here. Jump back to um, PowerPoint. Um, so um, the other thing we do uh, differently is getting getting the the specimens out of the bowl. Sam showed a, a you know a, using a plastic spoon and a and a brine shrimp net. That's a great way to do it. Um, and, uh, and, and that can work really well. I built myself with a wire coat hanger and some window screening. I built myself a little sort of sieve spatula that I use to scoop things out of, of uh, or pour the whirl pack bag on top of, uh, not the whirl pack bag, excuse me, the, um, the bowl on top of. And so all the bees then are, all the insects are collected and on that little screen. And then I dip that screen into a whirl pack bag that's already full of alcohol. Uh, so that's the other thing uh, to mention. We do bring our alcohol in the field. This is 70% ethanol, by the way, and uh, and we do bring that in the field. We um, we I'll have a jug in the car usually. Um, and the main reason for this is that uh, we're not. I think Sam is set up for returning to the lab at the end of every day, and and either processing specimens right away or handing them off to, to other people who are who are processing them. Um, we um, put more alcohol in our in our bags. We do use the same world pack bags that, that he does, um, but we put more alcohol in them because we are not getting to the processing right away. And in fact, sometimes not till the end of the season. And if you just have a little bit, uh, if you freeze it, I guess that could work. But if you have limited freezer space and you wanna just keep things in alcohol, we wouldn't be able to fit all of our bowl samples in the freezer, but we're not getting to processing them sometimes until September or, or, or October. So. Um, we put more alcohol in them to make sure that uh, it doesn't evaporate and, and the uh, insects dry out. Finally, I think the other difference is um, um, the whirl pack bags themselves. Um, I will reiterate the importance of having a label inside the bag written in pencil, and I'll show you the format that we like for, for labels that provide all the information that, that we would need. Uh, and um, and I, I think they're called whirl pack bags because he didn't demonstrate this, but um, you can those those ties that are at the top, you can you can grab those and um, and then swing the bag around, uh, you know, sort of towards you or away from you, and it whirls up and then and then rolls up so that it, it it's pretty tight, and then you tie those you wind those two ties together at the top. At least that's what I want to believe. Why they're called whirl pack bags, um, and I and it's it's fun. So I, I I do it that way, but um, whatever whatever works for you, as long as you're getting most of the air out, so you don't. Uh, make it an overinflated balloon and, and it can pop. But I definitely agree that they are sensitive to being <laughs> scraped by things and I've had leaks in the field. They, they do leak sometimes. Sometimes they get little pinholes in them and, and so you'll want to put those inside something else uh, as well. And the Tupperware is great for that too if you're, if you're willing to do that. I think I'll stop there for questions on bull trapping and then we'll, we'll go to iNaturalist. Hey Matt, um, there wasn't any questions, but one thing that we had found was 
helpful um, for timing um, and also perhaps social distancing was to have the break your two teams of two into um, one putting down one transect of bee bowls and filling them and then the other working uh, at setting down the other transect and get there to so getting those four transects out using two people in the field where they would just fill them on their own and lay them out and then do the sweep netting thereafter and then you get your your time in um, both traveling to the site collecting the pollinators um, through the bee bowls and then doing the netting and then you would just track your time you would do an hour of netting instead of a half hour for two people um, but that might be something that would be useful due to um, you know some of the social isolation we have to do right now yeah that's a great suggestion and, and um, Aaron and I were just talking the other day about how we have not yet really figured out how we will have how we will ask a two-person crew to work together in the field um, while keeping the appropriate distance. We'll be traveling, you know, to the, to the degree we can have two people in the field together. We'll be traveling separately, and and it's important that we're not, you know, passing equipment back and forth and, and so on. So um, I think that would require, in in your case, Polly, two jugs of soapy water, um, you know, and and just making sure you have everyone has the full set of supplies but as long as you've got that I think that's a that's a great way to um, yeah and it worked really well because sometimes the it was tight to get back in the time frame that we had um, so you're actually dividing the workload instead of and, and you get the bee bowls out quicker so that you can pick them back up quicker as well and if it's helpful I can write we have uh, I have the protocol written out I could share that with you um, to disseminate but yeah, we found it to be a little bit more efficient um, and then you didn't have one person not liking the way the bee bowls were set out by the other person. And um, it, it just seemed to be a little bit more efficient and worked out really well. And I think that would be, you know, practical for, for this situation. And um, you wouldn't have to carry as large of jugs of water out because you're dividing the amount of water in two. So, you know, you could use just a soda bottle with water in it uh, to fill up the bee bowls. Um, that's that's a no. It's a great suggestion. I mean, I think uh, um, there is a fair bit of time uh, that that our crews spend in the morning uh, for reconnaissance. So they they um, we ask that, and, and this maybe relates to the area when, when we you know in our sampling. And I haven't gone that much into the detail, but you know we have a um, we are assigned a point that that's uh, somewhat randomly generated. I'm not going to go into the details there either, but. Uh, we're assigned a point and then Aaron actually goes through and and reviews all those points using aerial photography and makes sure that um, they're going to capture enough of these sort of um, habitat types that we want to sample um, and adjust the point if necessary within certain rules. But that point then we send the crew there and they have, you know, they're, they're asked then to, um, to uh, find within 250 meters of that point, they're asked to find those four different habitat types. Um, and, and there are exceptions for when, you know, we, we allow it if, if there's only a couple of those habitat types, but there have to be at least two. It can't just be all forest or you're really going to get very little at all. My point is that um, there's some time in the morning, you, you know, if we want to get bowls out by 10 a.m., most sites you have to arrive by 9 at the latest really to, to figure out where you're going to put these. What's the best looking thing that we'll call a wetland. What's the best looking stretch of roadside? Where's the meadow that I want to go to? And you'll have some suggestion of that from your aerial photos and any other, um, any other field recon you've been able to do or um, remote recon you've been able to do. But there is a bit of time in the morning deciding where those transects go. So, it, it, you know, if you have um, time limitations that, that um, make it make more sense to have your crew split up, then that, by all means, then that's, that's a great way to do it. Um, there was a couple questions. One, uh, Sue Fustel asked about uh, using Ziploc bags to store the alcohol in instead of the whirl packs, I'm assuming. Yeah, I assume, I assume that's what she means too. And I, um, you can, and I think um, the key would be just making sure that they're fully closed. And, uh, and I, I've had Ziplocs leak. Um, but they are, in theory, capable of of um, of not leaking. <laughs> so um, 
just make sure you you um they don't leak and you store them upright. And if you're they're in your backpack or something, you would just need to find a way to keep them upright. And and sometimes Tupperware is good for that. So you can you can put everything inside a you know a, a plastic container that that forces them to stay upright. Um, and then you just have to be careful how much you you move them around and and um, and transfer them. But there's no reason Ziplocs shouldn't be able to work for that. Um. As a new mother, I could also suggest if you can't get a hold of Whirl Packs of getting the breastfeeding bags for milk. And those are very waterproof and um, very durable. Um, it would probably work better than the, um, the Ziploc bags because Ziploc bags aren't very thick. Um, the breastfeeding bags are, the milk bags are, you know, very thick and they also have a way of standing up so that it won't tip over. So those I would suggest in place of Ziploc bags and you can get them online and you can order, you can get them at, you know, like Target, places like that. Just, that's great. Just please don't mix them up. So accidentally <laughs> feed your child alcohol with that. <laughs> Although maybe that makes them get, uh, think about a career in entomology. So maybe it's worth it. Yeah. Um, the other question, from Jean was if uh, they you can photo in bee bowls and I'm not quite sure Jean do you want to um, turn your mo mic on and provide that question um, I think I'm just wondering if you can, if they're still swimming around if you could photograph them and then flip them out I'd say that's not that's not really your best bet. If you if you want to live capture bugs for, um, for photography, I wouldn't use bowls. I mean that the soapy water that's in the bowls, um, is really intended to to drown them. And and I mean if you're sitting there watching the bowl, and see something get caught, um, and then can get it out of the bowl to photograph it, because I don't think you'd get a very good photograph with in the water with sometimes with suds and other debris. It'd be hard to photograph them in there and you have to get them out pretty quickly before they before they drown. So I, I would think about a different method for live capturing things. You could, I wonder if, um, I mean, there's other ways to attract, you know, you could, you could, um, you could put, um, a little bit of sugar water or something sweet uh, on the bowl so you have the attractant of the color and the scent and then and then photograph things that come to that but you wouldn't have to use a bowl for that you'd probably just you could just do that with a plate or something or a, um you know something painted similar colors just to attract things sure. to take pictures of might be a better bet than the bowl methodology which is really in, in, you know um, designed for for trapping yeah. yeah yeah i was wondering i uh with in the morning, I have five gallon water, water buckets and water, water buckets that I leave out to collect water for my plants. And in the morning, there'll be moths swimming on them. And I, I oh, go every morning and I pull the moths out. Most of them have not drowned. They're just swimming. Right. <laughs> and, and I can do a lot of stuff that way. Yeah. So I, I was just wondering. Yeah, I think I think that's because you're not putting soap in there, which breaks the surface tension. And if you had soap in that in that bucket, the moths would not survive the night. Um, no, no, that wouldn't. right. Okay, thank you. Yeah, yeah, no, that'd be interesting to to experiment with for photography too. I haven't done much of that, trying to attract things on purpose to take pictures of only. I've just been opportunistically looking at flowers. Uh -huh. Other questions, Polly? Yes, there is a question from Laura. Um, do you want a picture of the, a photo of the habitat they're surveying in? We do, we do take photos. Um, I'll admit I'm not positive what we're doing with them yet. It's more of a, it's, it's helpful to document what the habitat looks like and there might be circumstances in which interesting records we would want to follow up um, and, and take a look at a photo and see if we can tell what might have made it an interesting place for insects. Um, uh, we have not 
formalize that in any way with our outreach. So um, we we take photos as part of our field crew efforts, and it and it's all on a, a field tablet um, that they they um, a kind of ruggedized electronic <clears throat> data collection. We have a form. Um, I'll show you the, the our own data form in a minute, and we have an electronic version of that, and it also allows us to take photos and tag them to the particular transect. And so we have a record of that. Um, I will, I would say that's um, nice to do, um, but it's not a requirement for us by any means. Um, and if people were taking photos, it would be useful to, I would assume, to have them geo reference. So to have your lat launch coded into the photo, if you're taking it with your um, smartphone or whatever device you might be using, Yes, definitely. I mean, otherwise we would have to match up. You'd have to write down the final name or something to be able to match it up to which transect it, it was representing. And, and that's true for iNaturalist too. If you're going to use your smartphone for iNaturalist, you can turn on, make sure that um, you're saving the location in um, in the, the metadata of the photo. And, um, and that's going to make iNaturalist much easier if you're using your smartphone for that and, and have location data on. So, um, be good for habitat photos too. Okay, and then the other question was, um, are you going to go over what data you want collected on the paper slip that goes in the world pack? Yes. Okay. All right, so um, we wanted to show you the data sheet that we are requesting of, um, of partners and, and uh, citizen scientists who are submitting specimens. So this is not necessary if you are uh, contributing through iNaturalist. But if you are, uh, if you are submitting specimens to us, uh, this is the data sheet that we we require. Um, I'm not going to go through the whole thing. There are there are detailed descriptions in the handbook. I want to point out a couple of things specifically, though. One is um, I think the date is a little bit of a different format from what. Um, what Sam recommended because they use Roman numerals, but um, we use uh, this particular format will help us um, make sure that we have the correct dates. Um, note that it's broken as if you were doing our full protocol and rather it's, it's, um, it's broken into four stations and each of those stations is one of those habitat types that I mentioned. So you, you could do forest, wetland, roadside, and um, meadow. Um, we realize not everyone is going to do the protocol that way, and so, but it's it's built to be flexible um, and and accommodate that protocol if you do use that protocol. So we have an overall name for a site, which we would have as a collection of stations, and then four of these station half sheets. Um, and this data sheet is available in the handbook, and it's also was shared with you as a, a separate PDF. Uh, just so you don't have to go through the work of extracting it from the PDF if you want to, or, or printing a single page if you want to print out multiple copies of this. Um, <clears throat> pardon me. The other key thing I think is um, is that um, we know that you are providing either lat longs um, or um, UTM coordinates with, with the appropriate zone. Um, and then we have, if you're doing a time search, you know we want to know the start time and end time and how many specimens you collected. If you're doing a bull transect, start time and end time, when they were deployed, when they were picked up, and the number of specimens and the number of bulls you put out. And then if it's an incidental collection, you found a bug or a handful of bugs and, and you wanna send those to us um, that you think are focal taxa, just tell us about what time you caught them, how they were captured, uh, and then some other basic descriptors. So um, it's pretty simple stuff um, and, uh, and you feel free to ask questions if you have them, but um, Otherwise, we'll, we'll move on. And, um, and the other thing to point out is make sure to keep this dry when you send it. If you are mailing us specimens or boxing up specimens for us to pick up, if we've made that kind of arrangement with you, um, we are down on Long Island periodically, at least in normal years. So there might be ways for, uh, for uh, me or, or um, others to, to collect specimens so that you don't have to put them through the mail. There are instructions in, in sending things through the mail in the handbook. I'm not going to go over that today uh, in, in any great detail. But keep that data sheet dry. That's the other thing. So maybe put it in a special, its own Ziploc bag, just in case there's a leak in one of your packages. And, and uh, we've, we've lost some data sheets from um, 
ink running on, on uh, and even pages ripping from uh, getting too wet. Matt, I have a ream of write in the rain paper. So I could print some in mass and distribute them if you if for those that aren't using the um, the geo paparazzi. That's a very that. generous offer. Thank you. Yeah, anyone who who might want some in, on write in the rain paper, that'll avoid the problem of of uh, them getting wet. Well, I won't avoid them getting wet. It won't matter if they get wet. And uh, and geo paparazzi, which um, Polly just mentioned, is the app we use um, for our field tablets that works on Android tablets and, and to some degree phones. So if that's of interest to you, if you're going to do a lot of data collection and would rather do things electronically, I should be able to share uh, the Geo Paparazzi stuff with you. It's not in our handbook because it's just a little uh, more complicated to explain. Um, but um, where is it in our handbook? I can't remember if we put that in our handbook or not, but Aaron might remember. Um, regardless, it's, it's a little more complicated. So um, Aaron just told me, nope, we didn't. So, um, uh, it, but I, I'm happy to, to share that. If you have a, a field data collection tool you want to use, it's, it's a great way to, to collect the, all the data you need and, and not have to deal with paper. All right, um, let's move to iNaturalist demo. Um, I'm going to demo two things in iNaturalist. One is, um, oh yeah. I have to join this. Um, sorry, I realized I'm going to try um, to demo um, the web version of iNaturalist and also the mobile version. They're a bit different. Uh, they have the same basic functionality, but um, but it's worth seeing it in both formats. I don't have an iPhone, so I can't show you an iPhone version. I can show you an Android version. I don't think they're very different um, between the, the two apps. But first, we'll do the, the web demo. and. Um, and so I'm going to share in a second here. I'm going to share Chrome. All right. So um, you should now be seeing the iNaturalist homepage. And, um, and many, maybe many of you have used iNaturalist in the past. Um, uh, if you haven't, it's great for all kinds of things, not just um, pollinator surveys, but um, it's, it's become my go-to field guide in some ways. I, I use it all the time to help me identify things. And, uh, and it's a great place to store observations of all kinds of taxa. Um, and, uh, and it's becoming an enormous, important, big data resource for a lot of people. And so I'm really glad that we chose iNaturalist to, to run this project on because I think it's um, it's contributing to the larger uh, set of, of community data on these on these um, pollinators too, and um, and it's and it's become really easy to use. So, one thing I'm going to show you, I'm not logged in, and so I'm just going to show you how to find our project. Um, you don't need much of the name, but it's called the Empire State Native Pollinator Survey. And if I just start typing those, oops. Empire State Native Pollinator Survey. The other thing I'll show you here is that um, when um, two years ago, uh, iNaturalist de debuted this thing called a collection project, it used to be that any single observation that you wanted to include in your project, you had to add individually and it was really cumbersome and really um, almost not workable. Since then, they, they um, built this thing called a collection project, which allows me in this case to, to simply specify the criteria, uh, you know, the different focal taxa within the state of New York over what time period, and in this case, I'm interested in all time periods, and, um, and iNaturalist will, will give me all the records in iNaturalist that meet those criteria, which is ultimately what I'm going to use to do a data analysis, but having our own specified project and its, with its own identity allows me to communicate with, with, um, with partners and I you know, I put a post on once every three months if I'm lucky, but um, but still, it's a way to 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 gather all the data kind of in, in one place. We're also getting more data on um, this project page than or more species recorded than are actually of interest to the project, and that's okay. Um, and the collection project is what I can use to filter it further to make sure that we only have the focal taxa. But if I go to the Empire State Native Pollinator Survey. Here we are, here's our project homepage. 
The number of observations has gone up even since yesterday, which is cool. Um, you'll see that um, we have certain superstars who have made thousands of observations. Um, our own Laura Chappelle is getting up there. She's number three. She's a, a natural heritage uh, wetland scientist and, and has, um, has really started to get really into pollinators, which is, which is super cool. Tells you the most observed species and gives you summary statistics. And then anyone can go in and look at these data um, and explore them and say, okay, I'm interested in a particular species. I'll, I'll query for that and, and where that is in New York. Um, and or uh, I'm interested in a group and maybe I'm interested in all the flies that have been reported on iNaturalist in, in New York and you can, you can find that or you can look at what pollinators have been documented in my particular park uh, in, in iNaturalist. And, and I don't have the time to demo all that sort of functionality to you, but mostly I wanted to show you um, how to upload and, and document um, an observation, how to upload a photo and document an observation. So I'm going to just Despite, if I go to this banner, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna show you this, but then not, not actually do it. Let me, um, let me log in. It's gonna be easier if I log in. It's not what I want. Yes, that is the email I want. Looking while I type my password, thank you. It's dot, 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 dot. For those of you who are curious. And, uh, and this gives me this upload button, and that's what I'm going to use to bring a photo in and, and, um, and, uh, and attribute it. If I go to add observations here, um, it's still helpful. It gives you the full screen of how to document an observation, but it does not allow you to use the, um, the artificial intelligence identification tool they call the Identitron. They don't advertise it very much, but I find it one of the more important features of iNaturalist these days. So you can tell it what you think you saw, and then you can uh, tell it, you know, some some descriptive uh, information when you saw it, and and any other descriptive notes you want to take and or want to make, and the place, and either with lat longs or by querying the map and and zooming in on the map, and then you add a photo to document it, um, and you can sync it with the metadata of the photo, and that's where if you've set your location services on, it can it can pull that in, but I can do that all up front by using this upload button instead. So I'm going to use the upload button and then I have to do a little bit something different to tag it to the project. So here is a case where I've got a photo and I'm pulling it in from my, I'm not showing you this, but I'm pulling it in from, um, from the hard drive of my computer. Any second now. Sorry, it takes a second here. I've got, um, where's my B? I had a B. Well, I had a B, but I'm gonna use this one instead. So I'm dropping this photo. You should be able to see me drop this photo. And it's a longhorn beetle. And, um, and it's not a great photograph, right? So watch here while I zoom in. This is the photograph I just dropped in. It's actually, I think, two mating beetles. Yeah, it's two mating beetles. Um, and it's not a fantastic photograph. It's, it's a neat bug, but, um, but it's kind of from the back. And you, know, you get the dorsal image, which is pretty good. And, um, and you can tell it's a longhorn beetle. It's got those long antenna and that, that typical flower longhorn shape that I talked about. Um, but I, it's not a, an award-winning National, Ge National Geographic photograph. Still though, when I click on species name, it comes up with suggestions. And it says, we're pretty sure it's in this genus, Strangolepta, which is a genus of flower longhorn beetle. And our top species suggestions are these guys. And the very first one is what it is. It is a Strangolepta, it's a flower longhorn beetle, Strangolepta abbreviata. It's called abbreviata because these stripes are abbreviated, they stop toward the base of the elytra. And so it's Strangolepta abbreviata. It's one of our focal taxa. Because I have, I've, uh, I've brought the photo in in this way, it has synced it with the location data and the time and date. So if I click on the map, it shows me exactly where I found this bug. It was along the Hudson River. There's this um, Hudson River Recreation area this oh no it's not called that it's called something else but it's right along north of Warrensburg um, if you know that area at all you can get down to the Hudson River and there's this beautiful 
a stretch of, of uh, native vegetation that's like a little meadow on the riverside. That's where I collected this bug. So I double check that it's doing it correctly. It's right near the Hudson River Ice Meadows, if you know that area. And, <clears throat> and uh, so I double check that it's, it's mapping it correctly, which it is. Um, and then I've got, um, I've got my place, I've got my date and time all set. I've got the species. Um, and the one thing I have to do differently because I didn't use the, uh, I didn't add observations from within that project page is tag it to our project. And because I'm, um, I've joined this project, so that's the thing to do if you have, um, if you have an iNaturalist account already is join the Empire State Native Pollinator Survey Project and then it will come up in your list of, of, uh, of projects to, um, uh, to possibly tag to. And so I'm tagging it to that. And once I've done that, it's, it's tagged. And again, I've, I've let on the secret that I will find the record anyway, even if it's not tagged to our project, but I like to have them tagged to the project because it shows the, the level of interest that, that um, to some degree we've helped generate. Um, Laura will be mad at me because I forgot to look up how to add the fields that, um, that she helped us build in, that there's some habitat fields. Um, that, uh, that, that she helped us build in so that people can, can choose habitat types. Um, and if she wants to chime in and remind me how to do that, feel free. Is she, doing uh, she said, click on the obs observation field, search ESNPS. Click on the observation field. Is it Look, there it is. That was easy, pollinator habitat. And then we have some major habitat types. So we ask you to pick. In this case, it was, I would call it an open. Oh my God, it's snowing where I am. Sorry, I'm looking out the window. It's snowing. All right, that's funny. Um, I would probably call it a, uh, an open, um, an open meadow of some sort, grass or meadow, because I know what it was like when I was there. And then there's also this, um, Secondary habitat, um, if you want to choose a second type, you know, if, you, if, it's a, if it's an open area that's next to a wetland and you want to choose both of those, you can do that. I'm not going to do that in this case. But so those, those habitat fields are great. Thank you, Laura. Um, and then if I hadn't already submitted this record a while ago, which I have, I would, I would submit it and you're done. And all we really need for the, for the um, project is that photograph with the date and the location. And, and that becomes a really important record for us of, of an, an observation of those bugs. So um, that's the way to do it um, in, the, in the, the web version. Um, and then iNaturalist will keep track of all your observations. It will, it will show you where you, if you're interested in the sort of semi-competitive side of things, it'll show you where you stand relative to other contributors to the project and how many, you know, how many of each species and how many how many you identify, and if you become an expert in some of these species, helping identify photos that are um, that are in the project is a real help to us. I mentioned that you know some things get identified more quickly than others. Uh, some are still sitting there. So we so far have been able to use about two thirds of the, of the photos that come into the project get identified to the level that allows us, and, and, and then confirmed by other people to the level that allows us to to make them useful in the in the project. So I'm gonna set up the, um, the mobile version. I'm hoping I'll get that to work. And, um, and if there are questions in the meantime, please shoot. Matt, this is Jean. Um, you know, we have a large group of, of, of collectors uh, in our pro the project that we're involved in right now, the pollinator project. I would like to be able to put all of our stuff in the iNaturalist, but is there a sub account that we could have? And I'd like to have it into your, into the Heritage Project. Is there a sub account that we could create to be able to keep our separate and then it can be integrated so that we can keep track of the data that we need um, for this specific project. Yes, and, and it's, it wouldn't even be a sub project, it would just be your own standalone project, but, but observations could be tagged to both. And that way, okay. there will be some okay. observations that are tagged to yours, but not ours, and some observations that would be tagged to ours, but not yours. 
And then you can also oh, okay. a collection project if you're interested in some other taxa or some other you know, areas of the state, you want to know what other insects have been, have been detected on your sample sites. You know, you could, yeah. you could do that in a variety of ways without tagging individual observations to your project. But I'd say build your own project and then, and then tag off yeah. observations as well. Okay, and I go into this iNaturalist and I get an account for right. the people that are going to be collecting? Um, you get an account for you. It's, it's by person. I mean, maybe there's a way to have a, a sort of group account, but I, I'm not sure about that. I haven't, I haven't done that myself. Okay. Okay. We'll explore that later. That would be really handy. Yeah, I think, I think that would be a good way to go. And I'm happy to talk about that and with you and another, you know, offline and, or another time if you'd like. Absolutely. We talked about following up. Absolutely. Us. Oops. So I hadn't joined yet on my phone and I'm just now. Maybe what we'll do. Oh, I have an idea. Okay, here's what we're going to do. Because I'm floundering a bit to figure this, to, to join by phone so that I can show you the, that demo. Instead, we'll jump over back to the videos and show a couple of, of Sam uh, washing and drying bees um, from bee bowls, particularly, or from netted insects if you collect into liquid. Um, um, Matt, I have a couple questions. Yeah, go ahead. Do that. So Broderick had a question on um, prioritization. And you know, how are you prioritizing certain taxa in iNaturalist? Prioritizing. Um, how are we filtering? Yeah, yeah how do you are you prioritizing them um, to identify certain taxa in iNaturalist, or is it just whatever is tagged um, you're then filtering through? No, good point. So we're we're not. Uh, in many cases, doing the observation, the, excuse me, the identification ourselves. Um, we are relying on the good nature of the nerds of the world out there to help us identify um, bees and flies. I mean, at, we are building our own expertise. And so, you know, Jeff and, and Laura have both identified a lot of flies. I've identified some beetles. Aaron's identified some bees. Um, but there are also other experts out there. One of the world's experts on bees is pretty active on iNaturalist and so he's been he's been and he's from New York so he's he's been um, uh, identifying a lot of stuff for us which is great I mean he's not necessarily doing it for us he's just doing it for the good of the iNaturalist community and it benefits our project um, but when things so so to a lar large degree we're sort of letting iNaturalist uh, do and, and its community do the work of prioritizing and identifying for us when we, um, when we know that there are taxa that we need help identifying and that aren't getting identified, we might end up tagging specific people, seeing if we can forward observations to specific people, experts we know, who can maybe help us out with, with, uh, with ID. Does that make sense? So we're not, we're not the ones really doing the prioritizing. We're, we're just sort of letting things play out. And, and, um, and then we might, in our last year, we might decide to chase certain identifications um, harder than, than others or more than others. That, that Bro I this is Broderick here. Um, yeah, so I was just, so I guess I, what I didn't understand is that the taxonomists working on this project uh, specifically are only being used to identify the sent in specimens. Correct. Uh, for, the gotcha. most, for the most part, that's true. So, um, um, the, um, the Cornell, for instance, has a contract with us under the project to identify bee specimens, but not to not to identify photos. In past projects, we have paid people to identify um, insects from photos, like the the dragonfly uh, atlas I mentioned. Um, we were able to do that. In this case, we're we're hoping that the iNaturalist community will will fill that need. And if it turns out that you know we need to call on our our network of experts to to help. Um, we, you know, just if it's thousands of photographs, we, we might need to be able to fund them to do it. But, um, but our hope is that, that we won't, that won't be necessary. Gotcha. Great. Thanks. All right, let's, let's jump back to, and it should just work from here. 
Boy. Let's jump back to Sam for a second while I get the photo, the phone thing set up. Um, how to get a good looking bee is next. Everyone seeing YouTube okay, I hope. And let me know if you're not and I'll start this one up. Um, hi, this is Sam Drogi, and this is a video about uh, washing bees. And we, uh, so first of all, the reason that we uh, spend a, an entire video on washing bees is we want to have good looking bees so that the people who are doing identifications, either you or someone else, has a bee that's nice to look at. Usually when they come straight out of alcohol or out of water, they look bad and they're all bedraggled, the hair is folded on, the wings are pinned against the sides. So we want to have nice, fluffy, good-looking bees. So that's what this video is about. Um, we have two techniques. One technique is going to be the use of um, an auto bee washer, and the other is a technique that just uses a simple canning jar with a screen cover. All right, method number one, this is the auto bee washer. No. And actually, I'm going to skip the first part. The auto bee washer is um, interesting. I don't know anyone who owns one, and it's not what we demo in our um, in our trainings. So um, it, this video is available for you to go look at later. But I'm going to skip to where he talks about the um, the mason jar and blow dryer method, uh, hair dryer method, because that's that's what we use ourselves in the lab. So I think, if I remember correctly, that's at four ten, right right on there. The second method, this is if you don't have an auto bee washer or dryer, I've done the same thing. I've got warm soapy water and with a specimen, but I've got it in a canning jar. And on top of the canning jar is some window screen, same stuff. And um, I just screwed it onto the top. And what I'm going to do is now, instead of stirring I'm, uh, and being able to do my email, um, I'm going to shake it by hand. This is something that you, know, you get your technician to do. Of course, doesn't, isn't allowed to use email during uh, working hours. So you just shake it, and I do this for at least a minute. And the reason for a minute is you have to get all the pollen and all the uh, nectar that has been regurgitated and anything else that's cruddy in there, and you're going to do that for quite a long time. And you have to be um, usually at the beginning set a timer to do this because people always shortcut this, particularly if it's scan your technician. They think, oh yeah, it's done now. So okay, that's complete. And uh, second phase is to um, rinse it out and it's just a simple matter of rinsing and replacing until there's no more sensitive water in there and um, again warm water hot water because um, for two reasons one is you um, it gets cleaner and second if you have warm water it's going to evaporate faster in the next phase which is to dry out um, the specimens in that jar with the hair dryer and we're going to show that in a separate video but for now it's the same idea take the jar, hold it carefully because it is glass, and um, snap out as much as possible of the water. You can do the alcohol thing again too, that's very useful, um, particularly because you're going to have to be drying this by hand with a hair dryer. One more. This is Sam Drogi, and this video is about drying bees, drying bees that we just finished washing. And again, the idea here is to get a nice set of good looking bees that are nice and fluffy, that have no stickiness and nice, good looking hair on them. Techniques one technique is going to use the auto bee dryer that we have created, and the other just uses a simple hair dryer. Method number one blow drying bees. So in the last video, you saw that we had washed bees in the canning jar. And um, afterwards, you uh, squirted a little alcohol in there. You shook out as much water as possible. Now you have to get rid of the rest of the water and dry the bees. So we use a hair dryer to do that. Um, you can use it either on heat, low heat, high heat, but you want a lot of air. So the key is um, more air volume than heat. I use a pad so that I can um, drop the jar periodically as I'm drying so the bees which stick to the sides of the glass um, fall off and in the end which might take anywhere from three minutes to maybe 
five, six, seven minutes, depending on how many bumblebees you have in there, which are the worst to dry. Um, you'll have bees that are just sort of swirling around in there. You can kind of tell that they're they're done. Afterwards, look at them under the microscope to make sure that they really are as done as you like them. Um, blow dry right through the screen. Um, don't want to have the blow dryer too close or the blow dryer will uh, shut off because you've overheated the element. Put it in the freezer if that happens and then will um, right itself. And if you do it too far away, then not enough air is going through. So you have to work that out for yourself and your hair dryer. Um, you want to do that until it's thoroughly dry and then afterwards um, um, check those are sort of the key elements to using a blow dryer. The auto bee dryer, which is the second method. So you saw in the previous video that we had a system set up with this tube and the bees are in there. They've been rinsed. All right, we're going to skip that too because that relates to the, the auto bee washer that he showed earlier. And again, you can watch that on, on your own time. Um, note also, and, and I'll, um, we'll, we'll do that pinning one in a little bit. About um, bees, pinning bees in one. But um, note also that Sam has, uh, has recently developed a method for washing and drying bees using um, a household washer and dryer. So if you're willing um, and willing to experiment a little bit, I wouldn't do this on your, um, uh, on your, your best specimens, uh, but maybe experiment a bit. Um, he's written up some, some methods and I think they're in the handy bee manual now. So the very handy bee manual is something you can easily Google and, um, and it's, um, and uh, he's got all these, all these um, descriptions are in there. He's obviously very bee focused, but these methods work for a lot of other taxa too. And beetles don't need to be as dry as, as bees and flies are a little more fragile. So you have to be a little more careful with them. But, um, but the washer and dryer uh, for bees is certainly worth a try. We tried it um, and didn't have good success, but probably weren't doing it right because he's, he's now um, said that's his favorite method of washing and drying bees. And it's a lot more efficient for him than these, these um, you know, single, uh, single sample at a time methods. So the other thing I'll point out is that um, is that uh, oh what was I going to say oh yeah that when we do the the um, the hair drying thing we we actually have the the jar inverted uh, so upside down with the um, with the hair dryer below and waiting for the bugs to sort of pop like popcorn. Uh, and, and and then get all fuzzy and, and dry out. I, I think that's personal preference. Um, we seem to have pretty good success with uh, with the bee salon, as Aaron calls it. Um, good. There's my home. There's my phone. Everybody, hi, hi, Matt's phone. There's my naturalist. All right, that worked. I think. So if I want to add a photo, this is my set of observations on iNaturalist and it pales in comparison to many other people's and it's embarrassing and it's not just bees, there's frogs and stuff on here too. And I'm not embarrassed at that. Um, but if I wanna add a, 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 an observation, um, there's the little, I'm gonna circle this. So you should be able to see the little plus sign. You probably can't see my cursor doing it cause it's on my phone, but the little plus sign at the lower right, I would add an observation that way and it would tell me Let's see, no photo. Well, that's not an option for us on iNaturalist. We don't allow that. So I can either take a photo with my, you know, it'll, it'll open up my camera and allow me to take a photo right on the spot um, and then upload that, or I can choose an image. And because it's April and it was just snowing a little bit ago and I'm not in the field, um, I'm choosing an existing image. And so I'm tapping that, choose an image, and it's gonna go, the recent images on my phone also has a frog. Go to photos. Just yesterday, I made sure that the bee photo or the beetle photo I wanted to put on here was available, and of course, it's not. <laughs> so hold on a second and see if I can find it. Doo -doo -doo. Well, you know, if I can fake it, if I have to. Yeah, that's just my camera. We went herping the other night. It was great. Um, that's what that is. Oh, and there's pictures of my daughter being goofy. Okay. Um, oh, I made sure that this was available, but it's not. So instead, we're going to choose a, a pickerel frog. <laughs> not what I expected. I'm going to say done. And, and then it's 
just like before, what did you see? And it might tell me a human, but in this case, actually, it's right. right? It says we're pretty sure it's in, it's in the genus Lithobates, American water frogs, and our top 10 suggestions include the very first one is pickerel frog, and it's right. And a lot of people can't tell pickerels from leopards in the field, and so iNaturalist at least has a hint that this is actually a pickerel frog, which is pretty impressive. Not a pollinator, um, but my, my beetle that I had set up to do this with yesterday didn't, didn't cooperate. So um, same thing, and then you would go through, you'd say, um, yep, yeah, it's a pickerel frog, I select that one, and I click select, and I was in Cropsyville, and so it's automatically, again, bringing in the information from the photo, and I do this in the field all the time. So I'll take a picture of a bug um, on a plant and right there in the field, upload it into iNaturalist and often get an identification or at least a narrowed down identification. Um, you really wanna shoot for photographs that you know, are uh, primarily have the organism of interest centered and, and, and somewhat large. Um, as much as possible, you wanna take photographs from multiple angles. Uh, especially for bees, it's pretty critical to get photos like for bumblebees of the face and for some of the other features we talked about um, that it would be critical to get a photo of the face. So multiple angles, back, side, front uh, is really the best way and you can upload multiple photos to the same observation and, and that's going to increase your chances of it getting identified properly. There's another add to project box at the very bottom and again because I've joined this one I, I check that and I could submit my record. This is not a pollinator, so I'm gonna delete this one. But that's the basic gist of doing it by phone. Any questions on that? Guess not, okay, great. Um, let's see where we are in the PowerPoint. Not much more to go here. Um, what I want to show you, here's INAT. Um, we have a little bit on processing and, and storing and shipping, and so a few pages on that, and then another video from Sam on uh, pinning. Actually, there's one on pinning and one on gluing specimens to pins, which I'll skip probably today. Um, we'll talk about uh, when you can, when it's good to pin and when it's not so useful to pin. But maybe I'll go through this material first. Uh, is everyone seeing my PowerPoint again? Tell me if you're not seeing my PowerPoint again. So processing, storing, and shipping specimens. Again, I mentioned we're not going to go that much into shipping. I can't demo that. Um, there, are just, there are instructions in the, the handbook. Um, labels, though, are critical, and somebody asked about this specifically. So um, here's the information we want on a label that's written in pencil, if it's going into alcohol or really even if it's going into soapy water, it's just less, much less likely to run. The site, whatever you call the site is, is okay. Um, ideally a name that, that others would recognize. Date, um, site coordinates, right? So when we, um, when we do our full protocol, we end up with eight samples because we have four stations and two methods at each station and we're keeping track of how things were collected. So were they collected in a bull trap? Or were they collected by net? Um, if you have other methodologies, we also put malaise traps on there when we have specimens from malaise traps. Um, and so we wanna keep track of those separately. And we end up with, like I said, with eight, eight different samples. Four of those are in the freezer because they're netted things that we netted into a cyanide vial. Four of those are, are um, in whirl packs with alcohol. Uh, so site, date, coordinates, these are in UTMs, but lat longs are, are just fine. Uh, the habitat type, whatever you name that station, if it's, you know, in our case, it's usually meadow, forest, wetland, roadside, but it might be others. And in, in the case of our target habitats like pine barrens, they just might be, if we're trying to capture just sort of generally the diversity of the pine barrens vegetation, but it's all pine barrens, we might just call it station one, two, three, and four. And then the collectors. So those are the labels that we request. Regular paper or write in the rain paper can work for those, as long as they're then they're put into alcohol or, um, or or into the vial that goes in the freezer. 
So our workflow is sort of like this. Um, things that are hand netted that go into a vial or a bag that we freeze, you can either, if, if they're not netted into a killing agent, you would freeze them to kill them and then pin them. Um, you can take them out of the freezer and pin them, you know, within 15, 20 minutes, probably they thawed enough to pin. Uh, if you've netted into ethyl acetate, you can pin them right away or freeze them to store them or cyanide. If you've netted them into soapy water or alcohol, like Sam had said, you would need to wash and dry them and then pin them pretty soon. Otherwise, they'd have to go um, into alcohol or the freezer at that point, but I wouldn't recommend washing and drying and then sticking them in the freezer. It seems like a lot of processing. If they're bowl trapped, they're in soapy water and then they probably transferred to alcohol. Uh, if not, you would, you would wash and dry them and then pin them or they need to go in alcohol or the freezer. And then what we call bycatch is really the things that we are not focused on in the project. Um, we will accept bycatch. It's not worth, um, and it says pin and was too small to pin and, and we're actually changing that recommendation at this point. Um, that it's probably not worth your time pinning what, you know, anything that you know is not one of the focal taxa if you're sending it to us um, because it, the, you know, it's less likely that we're gonna get to that as part of this project. And, um, and as long as they're preserved in alcohol or in some other, some other medium, um, then uh, we'll be able to pin them. We could always pin them later or somebody who, you know, when, when our, um, Nick Newman wasp expert comes along and wants to find all the wasps we've collected in the project, they can go through and, and pin what they need. Um, and we can keep things in storage for, for quite a long time. So um, that's, that's sort of our, our recommendation for bycatch. Shipping specimens, um, again, this is in the handbook. Erin uh, um, is, is um, having these uh, sent to her desk, which is, Great, we then have a lab space at the New York State Museum that um, we were graciously loaned. Um, we have a, a, a whole lab there to, to work on this project and possibly future insect projects. And, uh, and then so eventually they make, <clears throat> make their way over there. So the specimens are pinned in a box and I'll, we'll show you the pinning video in a second. Um, and you would make sure that there's cardboard laying on top so they don't bounce around, tape that shut, put that box inside another box. Uh, with some space around it and, and pack filler in there and then make sure the data forms accompany the specimens. If you're shipping bycatch or anything in ethyl alcohol, you really the, we're asking people to process and pin their own specimens. If you, um, we just don't have the person power to do all of that ourselves. So, um, so if you're shipping bycatch in ethyl alcohol, here's the protocol for doing that and, and to make sure that things don't leak or if they do leak that there's some way to um, to adjust it and it's, you know, paper towels um, just to make sure they absorb any, any leaks um, and same, same sort of padding and make sure the labels are inside the little pack or Ziploc bag. Okay, before I, so I'm going to jump back over to Sam unless there are questions about, um, about storing, processing, pinning. Where is Chrome? There's Chrome. Nothing right now? Okay, we'll have some time at the end for questions. So let's, let's watch Sam again. Moss, we're gonna show you pinning techniques. We'll have another video that covers gluing techniques for very small specimens and dried specimens. So the basic idea is that we'll show you how to insert a pin, where to insert it, and the height of a, a bee pin on the specimen. So initially you'll start with a set of bees. They have come right out of a kill jar and are fresh and uh, soft, or they've come out of alcohol and you've processed them. Um, dried and clean them. And what you want to do is you want to get a pin to go through the specimen and be placed between the two tegulae, between the two front wings on the sputum. And when it's on in that position, you're going to be shifting the pin to the one side or the other, usually to the right hand side. Um, so it's not in the center line. The reason for that is if it's in the center line, it's going to be destroying um, characters that are associated with the middle part of the sputum which are often important ones for bees. And if the specimen's very small, it can take up a good chunk of the entire specimen. So after you insert the pin into the specimen, and the way that I hold this is I hold the specimen between my thumb and my forefinger in one hand, 
and then with the other hand, I've got the pin. And then I take my middle finger and I press against the bee specimen. I place the pin into this top part of the uh, specimen in the right position. I move it part way through and I either use my fingers to slide the specimen up to the uh, near to the top of the pin or in a particularly with small specimens, I will jab it into the uh, styrofoam just like that to um, get the pin partially through and then it's easier to run up to the top. Um, in terms of height on the pin, some people will use a pinning block and that's fine, but it takes a little bit of time away from the uh, process of, of pinning up many bees in a day. So um, it's better to learn how to set the height of the bee on the pin without using a pinning block. And to do that, I can use my thumb and my forefinger as a stop for I run the bee up to um, an area that's about a third, maybe a little bit less from the top of the pin. Um, functionally, what you want is to be able to put a number of labels below the specimens and that when that, oh, that specimen is put into the tray, the labels aren't getting um, um, pushed back up into the specimen and there's plenty of pin that can go into the tray. And you don't want the specimen too high so that when someone with fat fingers picks that specimen up, that they're actually breaking off um, antennae or other body parts when they're trying to look at and use the specimen. So it's a balance, um, but it's something that you can very quickly um, get used to um, setting without having to use pinning blocks. Um, and then the bottom line is that um, you want that specimen to be horizontal to the pin and not roll to either side. And um, with, uh, again, with a bit of practice, you can do that all uh, quite quickly. So we wanna show a few uh, pictures of specimens that have been pinned very well and a few specimens that have not been pinned well. There's a specimen with a pin in the far right-hand side away from the center line near the tegula. So that's a, a specimen in the proper position. Here's another one, same uh, sort of location. You can clearly see the pitting and the other hairs that are often um, located in the middle. Then we'll show you a series of three specimens not pinned so well. So here's the specimen is pinned essentially in the center. And that's the basic problem is the pin is in the center um, of the um, scutum and it's gonna be blocking um, important, uh, important features. And this is particularly important when the specimen is very small. Again, we have some videos coming up that will show you how to glue specimens, what gets rid of the problem of, of pins going through small, small specimens, period. But sometimes you're stuck and you need to pin, so you need to be careful on where you put that pin. All right. Um, a couple of things I'll point out is that um, are that. This is a video about gluing specimens. It's possible to pause when you want to pause. Um, when <laughs> the first is that. Um, the first is that uh, I'm glad not to have had my specimens shown as the examples of the poorly pinned ones because many of mine would qualify um, and be far worse than just in the middle. So, I mean, I've pinned wings, you know, I've pinned through the leg <laughs> instead of the, the body. And it's just, this is uh, not something I was trained to do. And so um, uh, it's a learning process and you won't, get to the speed that Sam has and you won't get to the perfection that, that Sam and his technicians are, are trained to do right off the bat. So uh, give yourself some, you know, some patience. The other thing is he's dealing just with bees. Um, I'd say the same general rules and methods apply for the other taxa, beetles and, and flies that you might collect. Again, we're not um, recommending uh, catching and, and, um, and killing moths. Um, we can, we can get those from photographs as much as possible. It does happen, and, and if you really need to document something that you see, um, we're not gonna object. I would, again, think that impacts on populations are, are uh, negligible. But, um, but the, um, <clears throat> pardon me, the um, flies are really fragile, and, um, and so um, their bodies are soft, and, and so when you, um, when you pin flies, the, you know, their bodies get a little squished, and um, I don't pin just in my fingers ever. I always pin on, on top of foam and that's a squeamishness thing, I think, because um, I, you know, the way he does it, he probably can 
um, slide a bug up a pin and having pinned it in his fingers and not get stabbed, but I feel like I'm klutzy enough that I will, um, I will make lots of holes in my fingers and I'd rather not do that. So I pin onto foam and I push it up um, using foam. And, uh, um, but then um, make sure after you've pinned that you're still grouping all your, all your, all your uh, specimens by site and method and, and station and method. And so all those, those eight different, in our case, eight different um, samples that we have uh, per day, um, you know, everything's grouped together in a specimen box. Um, and, uh, and again, those details are, are going to be in the, um, in the, in the handbook. So I want to leave, we have 10 more minutes and I want to leave time for questions. I'm just going to point out that um, we'd love it if you'd register for the project. There's a sign up page on our, our, uh, our website, which is uh, mwanhp.org slash pollinators. Uh, and, um, and that's all the, the formal presentation I have. Oh, gluing, I'll just mention gluing pins briefly. Um, or not gluing pins, but um, gluing insects to pins. You can look at Sam's video about that. We don't do that typically. We, we often use points, which are little triangles of cardboard. Um, sometimes we do glue insects directly to pins. I don't think it's a bad way to go, um, but, um, but we try to pin them first. And, uh, or, and if they're too tiny, um, or, or if the pin would just, <clears throat> just, um, just destroy the specimen, then, then gluing them in one way or another is, is a good way to go. Um, so the last page, just a, a thank you and um, my email, feel free to reach out if you have any questions. Our website is there. It's, it's, um, it's not fancy, but it, it's got all the information you would need. Um, and, uh, and, um, and big thanks to Sam for letting me uh, present his videos. He doesn't know, <laughs> but he is, I'm also sure he doesn't mind uh, because that's why he put them there. And, and I'll let him know that, that we uh, successfully, I think, used them here in this training. So uh, happy to stop for questions at this point. I would say if people have questions that they could just unmute and ask the questions directly is, is fine. Hi, Matt and Polly, this is Sue Fustel. Um, I did write in a question. Um, if you don't want to address it in this forum, that's fine, but um, it has to do with honeybee colonies. Right. And, um, Recently, um, some of the local community around Comset State Park has been interested in introducing honeybees and setting up a colony. Um, my first recommendation was that we need to do a pollinator survey prior to any further discussion. Um, but, and I, I did find two studies that did, um, I would say basically warn against setting up honeybee colonies without this information. But what I'm wondering is if you could maybe direct me to, or if you know any, um, any studies or guidelines that are set up that in the event that this colony is allowed, I don't know, it wouldn't be up to me, it would be up to New York State Parks, that there are guidelines. Has, that, has any study or research been done as far as the number of boxes or supers that can impact on the native pollinators? Great question. I, and I don't know if the research is, is there yet. Um, I do know that, that there's a New York City pollinator working group that, that is thinking a lot about these issues too because uh, rooftop and urban beekeeping is, is, um, is, is really exploded and is seen as a, a, a you know, a, a great way to, to have agriculture in the, in the city. And, um, and, and I think there's, I think there's a lot of, um, and, and people want to make honey, and that's you know that that's that's a, a worthy goal. Um, but I think there's been a fair bit of um, confusion about honeybees being um, not recognizing that they're not native and and that they're really an agricultural commodity. They're like they're the they're the chickens of the pollinator world, right? And and so um, people think, oh, honeybees, we gotta we gotta save our pollinators, and and really that's not the issue. So spreading that message as much as possible is good. I mean, the the, the other tricky part is that honeybee colonies, when they're set up in a way that allows people to view them, like they are at a local nature center here, they're fascinating, right? So they're, I mean, it's really educational for people to be able to see inside an active honeybee colony. I do think there are probably other um, native bee um, demos that you could have, you know, with, with bee houses and, 
and possibly with mason bees, some solitary bees, but maybe even some colonial bees. I, I don't know whether that's kind of how, how mainstream that is yet. Um, and I certainly don't expect that anyone's done enough research to say, you know, this number of honeybee hives is, is going to have an impact and this number is, is not. Um, I suspect it would be a while before that research were, were, were available. And, and also, um, also it's hard to know what else, you know, who else has backyard bees. I mean, I don't think they're even all licensed and certainly not um, uh, all mown. So there, there are, you know, there are beehives, honey beehives all over the place at the moment that mm -hmm. we don't even know are there. And so whether, you know, the state park setting up a hive or two is going to have an impact is, it's really hard to say, but there's some research out there that's showing the impacts of honeybees, and and that's something I could dig up and share. That'd um, be great. Thank you. Sure. I follow Thank up you. with me by email if you, if I if you don't hear from me soon. Okay, we'll do. Thanks again. I just posted um, four um, references on the chat window related to reputable. Um, references about the impacts of honeybees on native pollinators and it did give there's one that does give recommendations for how many hives to have and um, so you might want to try those uh, sites. That's great thanks Polly. I can email them too because once we sign off of here and they're going to disappear. Um, so Evelyn said, uh, great training. Thank you to Matt, which I concur. Um, a couple things I had, unless anybody has any other questions. No? I answered all the questions. Fantastic. Don't hesitate to reach out if you have others, if something else comes up, or if you are able to do some surveys and, and have questions about the methodology or your approach or where to go, or um, you can feel free to reach out to me and I'll help you if I can. So a couple things that I had um, to offer is, you know, due to the, the uh, COVID-19, uh, there's challenges with shipping equipment and materials and probably accessing those. So one of the things that, you know, I uh, the commission could offer is um, we do have a large container of ethyl acetate. So if anyone needed some of that, we can put them in vials in the cotton balls and, and ship them to you. If you're um, going to be doing um, the bee bowls or the netting, or actually the netting, um, and you'd like to um, have the ethyl acetate, if you wanna email me, um, we can provide that. I'm not going to use all the ethyl acetate that we had to buy in one swoop. We also have experience of creating the bee bowls, and if I can get the uh, little cups, we could make up bee bowls for folks that are interested in doing the pollinator bee bowl sampling and get those to folks as well, as well as um, photocopying the sampling sheets. Uh, I just need to know who you are, your address, and what materials you're looking for. I also may have world packs that we could share. So. Um, generous. Thank you, Polly. Uh, I should also point out that the, the bee bowls that we use, um, we, we buy pre-painted. And there's a, um, in the very handy manual, the, the bee manual that, that Sam and his partners have put together, there's a, um, a resource for or uh, the address and maybe website of a place that sells pre-painted bee bowls. I think it's a um, possibly um, mentally handicapped uh, workers. And, and so it's um, providing a service and, um, and they're not that, not that expensive. So might be worth it if you're lazy like us and just wanted to. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing I could offer too is uh, last year, um, Dan Gillerain's assistant did a uh, live, live pinning training for us. And if we could, I could offer to set that up too, if anyone is interested, um, where she could, you know, go through the different types of um, pinning and the size of the needles, um, do an, a live demonstration and similar webinar, and how to also do the gluing, which I thought was very helpful. I know we have the webinar um, that Sam has created, but if we wanted a, a live one, 
where you can ask questions and things, you know, I'd be willing to reach out to, to Dan and, and see if they would be willing to do that again for us. So. It, the more hands-on experience you can get, I mean, at our, at our usual trainings, we'll, we'll have everyone give it a try, you know, just so they get the feel of it at least. And then it is something that, that uh, only gets better with practice. And, and Right. So I guess I would just ask those out there, would you want me to set up a, a pinning demo and gluing demo? Um, I don't want to put the effort into it if it's not something that would be useful to everyone or, you know, majority of folks. I got a yes from Evelyn. <laughs> so, um, well, I guess if you're interested, send uh, Jade or myself an email. Um, you have Jade's email. And if you would like any ethyl acetate, uh, bee bowls, uh, data sheets made, or wool packs, uh, let us know. Um, alcohol is in short supply right now, but uh, what we've used is, and I, I think this is okay, Matt, is the 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 uh, alcohol that you can get in mat in like a gallon uh, metal container from the hardware store that might be more readily available. I think so, and and I think and I forget what formulation that is. And it, what would be yeah. great is just to know, um, to know what they're put in. I mean, if anything short, even isopropyl rubbing rubbing alcohol can work in a short term situation. For longer term storage, you want ethanol, and I'm not sure what's in the hardware store alcohol, if that's a different kind of alcohol or not. Um, but um, as long as we know what's in it and we know if we need to change it out, we can do that. All right. Well, thank you very much, Matt, for your time. Uh, and also to Aaron for helping put the protocols together. You know, I think this is a I love listening to you talk and, and listening to you know, these presentations. They're so informative and helpful um, just with the identification and, and your experience, the little nuances of tips are, are very helpful. And we are looking forward to getting out in the field. I was out yesterday and the high bush blueberry are blooming. Wow. <laughs> they just broke flower. So uh, we'll be out sampling in the next week or so. And um, it's very exciting. Well, thank you, Polly and, and Jade and others at the Central Pine Barrens for setting it up. And, and thank you all for listening. This was a lot of fun. All right. Well, thank you, everybody. Um, unless there's any last questions, uh, we'll sign off and um, shoot us an email if you're interested in the, pee the, pee the peeing. I don't want to know about peeing. Pinning demo. <laughs> all right. Thank you.